Hey, this is Dag, and you're listening to Beyond Trek Podcast. A red alert. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Beyond Trek Podcast. <laughs> Today, we've got Big J and Renzo in the house, and we're going to talk to you about Discovery Season 4, Episode 5, The Examples. So this is your official spoiler alert. Spoiler opening scene right away Renzo you almost spoiled it for me but I got right to there that was just it, really I great I think spoiling anything like being like oh the USS Janeway's there isn't that big of a spoiler so I'm, I'm, considering your attempts to spoil the hell out of me for Oblivion Gate I'm being hyperbolic uh, I don't really mean that Like I, I kind of take the opinion like the existence of something in a form of media is not necessarily a spoiler necessarily if you tell me like Peter Parker from like the Raimi verse is in Nowhere Home. I'm gonna be mad because I haven't seen is it. Is he? Yet. I don't know. I ain't seen it I haven't, yet. <clears throat> haven't seen it. I'm staying away from YouTube. Yeah. Maybe. No, my Twitter feed started lighting up, and I was just like, done with Twitter for the day. Yep, turn right it yet. off. <sighs> well, I'm going tomorrow night with Nacho to see it. Awesome. And I can't wait for that. Yep, I'm gonna be there in five hours. Oh, lucky overnight on Spider Man podcast. With, yeah. <laughs> well, let's get back to these Vulcan ships. They're beautiful, <laughs> they're reminiscent. Renzo, take us away. So, what I think is actually neatest about it is that you can see some clear evolution from old Vulcan designs, whereas the older ring ships only had like one point connecting to the, the annular warp drive, the, the ring drive. Uh, this one seems to have more, which is nice. Hmm. The old ones only had one? I yeah, so the Sarak only noticed. had like the spike at the bottom that connected. Then yeah. the Dakirs connected only on the sides, right? Yeah. This okay. guy looks like I think he connects in three places because the thing on the bottom splits, which is neat. But we don't get enough of a look to be like 100% certain about it. But it's a real pretty ship. It, I actually really like the color of the lighting inside of the windows being different than the Starfleet ships. So the Starfleet ships' windows are all this like typical sterile blue-white light that we see always inside. Right. The one inside the Vulcan ship is much yellower or redder, which would match which the lighting of the sun of Vulcan, because it's a redder sun. So the fact that they would have their internal lighting match that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Yeah. Get that vitamin D on their terms. <laughs> But yeah, it was nice to see the NSS Topal alongside two Starfleet ships all together observing the DMA at the beginning of the episode. Oh yeah, it shows. It's that, nice uh, to see a joint mission exactly. now. That it, yep, sorry, didn't mean to take your thunder. No, no, you got but, it. That's exactly. It. It's just nice to see that the Navar integration of the Federation is actually you know doing something. Yeah, I I thought that the the look of the Vulcan ship. Yes, it was, it was great. It showed advancement. But to me, it seemed like it wasn't that much of a departure from Vulcan ships from like, okay, in almost a thousand years, they still kind of look the same. Hell, it looks even similar to the Vulcan ships we saw in Enterprise. But I guess that's if there's nothing wrong with the design, you have nothing to fix. Yeah, Vulcans are a particularly conservative people, right? Like, mm -hmm. we know that they don't like change really much at all, and they've been spacefaring for thousands of years. So if they've got a design that seems to work well for them, they're going to stick. The biggest change that I see is the hull coloration on it. It's not great lighting, so I might be wrong here. If we get better lighting, it might look redder again, but the hull coloration looks that, like that silvery blue color that we see more commonly on the 32nd century ships rather than their traditional, like, reds and oranges. I actually thought it was a Starfleet ship so just under a Vulcan design and name. So that, that so got did me. I. But the fact that it's the NSS Tapau is the giveaway right. there. Navar science ship, I presume, or something. Right. Well, yeah, I that almost was a really interesting intro to the episode. I almost got a little excited because I, I got abrupt. I thought the Janeway was the science ship and I was like, Oh, so Janeway's history and science, like they really like legendized her. That that that, that was really cool. On my um, first watch of the scene, I had the same thing. That's actually why I messaged you being like, "OMG, USS Janeway." <laughs> That's what I thought it was. But on <laughs> second watch, through, I realized, "Oh wait, Tapau, NSS Tapau." Well, that makes more sense. Though. Yeah, maybe a little bit. But 
Um, yeah, no, in, in, in kind of defense of the, the aesthetic, um, doubling up on the fact that the Vulcans have been spacefaring for at least a thousand years before Earth, uh, 2000, because the Vulcan exodus, the Romulan exodus happened 2000 years before first contact approximately. Right. Um, yeah. you know, they, they definitely wouldn't, wouldn't fix what ain't broke. But then also, if we look at Starfleet design, we still have the main hull, a secondary hull, and the cells. Some of the configuration's a little bit different, but the, the body plan is still right, there. Yeah. One, a couple things I wanted to point out, actually. So we've seen these a lot in the last couple episodes, but they're, they keep calling them like work bees. If you look at the design of the work bees that Discovery has launched and have been in the last couple episodes, they look mm -hmm. a hell of a lot like the jellyfish from the 2009 Star Trek movie. It's got that same long stretched out shape with instead of having two pylons that go along the like exhaust there's only the top one but it's very reminiscent of that look and what i was going to say was the color of the tapau in this intro scene is the same color as the jellyfish from that because the jellyfish had that metallic blue color rather than the red well and the jellyfish was constructed on vulcan yep and, yes it was and this in show, the prime timeline yeah, yeah, yeah in the in the prime timeline and so we're still sort of following a little bit of the aesthetic that was established there Okay, so any more comments on this little quick intro that happens with the DMA just, like, poofing out of existence? Well, I do have a science criticism. Sure. Okay. Um, an anomaly that is three light years across, if it vanished that quickly to our eyes, that means it happened millennia ago. But on the sensors for everybody else, it happens now and then it gets detected now. So I'm just assuming that the whole show is filmed through the lens of a, of a light speed camera to be yeah. able to predict the, the, the appearance and disappearance of the anomaly. Okay, That's wait, a fair what? point. So, Big J, right? If something moves and it's three light years away, it's going to take yeah. three years for the light to reach you to show that it moved or disappeared, right? Right. But if the thing is three light years across and it just shrinks and poofs away, it's going to take about three years, a year and a half for you to even realize that it's happening if you're just looking at it with your eyeballs looking out a window. Okay, well, but how far away were the ships? Doesn't matter. From... If, well, I mean, if I can see on the screen, I can see end to end. So I can assume that that's three light years there. Then yeah. I triangulate my position. If, if my focal length to the, to the sides of it is three right. light years. Right, let's say I... safe distance away is three light years. Well, you know, if, if the focal length is I can see both sides of it. So I can uh -huh. see three light years at the end of that triangle. So right. the, the short end of the triangle is three light years across. I can mm -hmm. triangulate to determine my distance to that three light years. Exactly. And it's okay. way more than three light years. It's like 10 or 11, probably. Yeah, they're going to be far away, and then it's still going to take, like, the actual change of its size is still going to take time to reach you, right. like, at least three light years roughly and if something like you're probably close on 10 or 12 but it, yeah yeah so the, it wouldn't be a triangle three three and three no okay. it would be it would be like three 11 11 because it's, okay. it's a lot it's an isosceles oh, yeah you're right you're i got you yeah. okay okay um you raise a good point because but this is something that's been true in all of star trek right like we see ships engaging well, in combat from very far away we see things yeah. like the Hova supernova going off, and it's like, we're seven minutes away. Why did that instantly happen? <laughs> but just assume these things are seen through like a subspace telescope lens, rather right? Than right. Models. Right. It's just it's a continuing criticism that I have of the way that gravity and light are are used in Star Trek, in all three Abrams movies, and now with this. Um, the I, don't get me wrong, the story is still compelling. The characters, I'm in love. It's just a thing I have about the science of the way they handle these super massive phenomena. Yeah, the only show that I think really happens to convey the distance of seeing something and then when you can react to something very well, the only show I think that does this well is The Expanse, right? Like in the most recent episode, spoilers, uh, they actually see rocks heading for Earth with, with telescopes. And then it's like, okay, so we saw that they're this far away. That means they're now this far away and we have this many seconds to react kind of thing, right? Because they've now moved beyond the range from when they were seen. Very much so like, just, go ahead. Oh no, it's just, it's just, it shows relativistic travel really well or not relativistic, like semi-relativistic travel well. Do you remember the Picard maneuver? Yes. yes. The Battle of Maxia, Picard's way back here 
and he needs to trick the Ferengi. So he warps closer so that light from where he was and light from where he is closer reach the Ferengi at the same time, confusing them into thinking there's two ships and they bug out. Yes. Then right. the time time catches up and we see the the Stargazer actually go to warp and arrive at its present location. So that's what we're talking about like there. And then the third thing I want to talk about how cataclysmic that would be if you just were sitting there and you saw a three light year across anomaly collapse in a matter of seconds, you're dead. Because the amount of gravitational, you know, inertia to, to do that, by the time you see the event, you're dead. We don't know if it's if it's collapsing with gravity, though. It could be collapsing because space is shrinking, right? Like the same way a warp drive bends space. That won't affect you, depending on, unless you're right up against the damn thing. Well, and one other thing to take into consideration, and this would be jumping ahead in the episode, so... I'll, I'll come back to this part and what I was going to say because it's directly tied into what we talk about later in the episode. That way we're not we're not bounced around. But I I think I've got a theory as to why it's happening the way that it is as part of this conversation. But what I'll have to wait till later. Cool. Okay. Okay. So our next scene is this beautiful scene with uh, <laughs> with Stamets looking at the map and jet reno finally shows up this season and i love jet oh, reno where the hell is uh, she grumpy been? lady uh she they're both looking at the map being like well the dma is gone how did you lose it? it it's not there anymore and we see this fantastic map of like the local area near start near near earth mm -hmm. and we see a whole lot of very recognizable planets we see some places we haven't heard of in a hell of a long time some great references to episodes like uh, the lights of Zetar. Zetar is on the map. Memory Alpha is on the map. Uh, Akali, which becomes relevant later in the episode, is also on the map. Uh, and we just, you know, it's it's a good like local space map that we don't see very often in Trek. I also really, DMA. I just I liked seeing like Denovula, Wolf Three Five Nine, Novara is on the map as its own thing. I just that was really cool. I was yeah, trying to see if I how many really names good. I could catch. That yeah, makes me have to rewind and pause. Quaylor. Oh, Quaylor's familiar. Did. Why is Quaylor from Quaylor 2? What happened to Quaylor 2? That's the repository with all the old ships. Right. That's where the... Uh, he's not a pack lad. He's a Zakdorn. Yes. The Zakdorn yes. dude. Yes. And that was yeah, yeah. Unification 1 and 2. Got it. Okay. Clem Dakashin. Yeah. Wow. We also see other planets that we've only seen in like one episode before. So like Nausicaa is mentioned, Pollux mm -hmm. is mentioned, uh, the Prior's world is mentioned is on the map. It's it's really a like where's where of planets that we knew were somewhere near the Federation. And it also lists Starbase locations, which is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So four point two seconds later the DMA reappears a thousand light years away. Which is terrifying. Yeah. And why? Because why not? Oof. Yeah, it also gives us an interesting thing of scaling for the Federation itself. So we know that from the map that they're showing us that it disappeared uh, somewhere near-ish to Navarre and Dralax, right? Mm -hmm. Which isn't very far from Earth, because we know that Navarre isn't far from Earth. Uh, and it appears near Deneva, which we know is a, star f a Federation colony that's referenced as far back as TOS. Mm -hmm. So in TOS, the Federation was already a thousand light years across. That's that's in, that's interesting knowledge. That's not something that we knew before. That's pretty big. Yeah. I mean, so tra traveling in the in, um, Federation territory. Well, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, it just it's it takes a little longer than the one week trip that um, Picard's archaeologist, um, you know, he was the protege of. When yeah. they were looking at the, yeah, we'll just go from one end of the Federation to the other. It'll take about a week, week and a half. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, um, you, by I'll Voyager speed, it should name. take you about a year, Galen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right, Professor Galen. By mm -hmm. Voyager speeds, it should take about a year to cross a thousand light years, roughly. Right. So. Yeah. Well, and then also, um, you know, to, to look at TOS and be like, wow, it was already a thousand light years across. Um, I don't. I don't think it necessarily means that we'd explored the entire area. We could have just established a boundary, and that was agreed upon by some treaty at that time. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. The only other notable thing I wanted to point out, though, is some of the planets that we see here that have, like, blue markers on them, which I'm presuming means that they're part of the Federation on this. Uh, some of them are planets that we know were not Federation planets before, so it's interesting to see that now they're counted that way. Um, so one of the examples is Rator, which, if I remember correctly, was a Klingon world or a Romulan world, depending on when it's referenced. Hmm. Romulan. Well, yeah. Nelvana is another. Yeah, and, and the only thing I have to go off of with saying that's Romulan is because I play the mobile game Star Trek Fleet Command, and Rator, Rator, however you want to pronounce it, is in Romulan space. So, mm. you know, I don't know. That's way cool. Yeah, yeah and Picard, it was actually claimed by the Romulan Free State. Well, I know and that. And even right. Nel Nelvana is on here. Mm -hmm. And Nelvana 4, something else happened. I forget what. But. You know, Nelvana used to be like a film production company back in the early 80s, if you didn't know it, that. So Nelvana was in the Romulan neutral zone, which we know doesn't yes. exist anymore because the Romulan doesn't, the Romulan state doesn't exist anymore. So, Right. The Romulan Nelvana free state four. is now just the Navar. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so anyways, it just shows some interesting progression, stuff that makes sense, all pretty logical shit, right? Like good yeah. work here to the people who did the graphics and like told the graphic people what to put here. So, all right. Uh, cut to our next scene, which is now Stamets explaining this same exact same discussion that we've just had to Saru, to Burnham, and to Book. Uh, and suitably, everybody's all freaked out because things don't just move in space without a reason, certainly not that fast. Uh, and they bring in a, a character that we haven't heard much of before. Jet and she, no, no, no. Zora. I, I, and we I'm get just... good discussions with her all episode, which I really liked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Zora. I'm glad that we got the computer a little more because why not? It's almost like another character because you can have the conversation with it. Yep. You, you could kind of sort of a little bit on the um, 24th century ships, but it wasn't, it was more asking a question, posing a theory, getting a statistical probability statistical, or something. Right, yeah. uh, you know, probability response. But this one's like, you know, talking to an actual I would, person. So two things. I would say though that the TOS era computers kind of had a little bit of snark to them, right? Like sometimes when they would give answers to questions that were asked, it almost sounded sarcastic when answering things. It was pretty funny. Yeah. Majel Roddenberry was a genius for how she delivered those lines. <laughs> uh, but two, the scenes throughout this episode with Zora and Burnham really, really remind me of Andromeda with the ship Rami and the Captain Sorbo played by Sorbo, talking things back and forth. It's a lot like that. Gotcha. Okay. So the neat thing in this scene is we see that Booker automatically jumps to the who did this, why would they do this, how do I find them to snap their neck kind of thing, which yeah. is mm -hmm. very reasonable uh, considering what he's gone through. He's been pretty gung-ho about a lot of this stuff. Like he's, he's looking for something tangible to go after because to me, this is a guy that needs to have a target, a thing, a person, something to look at, fight, hit, shoot, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about a subspace, not subspace, but you know, an anomaly, a dark matter anomaly, you can't really, you can't Kirk chop that. You, you know, you can't do the double fisted overhand thing or the flying kick. You, you can't do that stuff with this. It's true. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge for everyone involved, right? Stamets yes. sees this as a scientific problem that he just has to understand, and he feels like he owes it to Book. Burnham mm -hmm. wants to save lives. Saru is trying to prevent more deaths for, like, whole planets. They've all got motivations that pretty much line up together, except for Book. Book definitely is tinged with some revenge in this that I don't think anybody else is, and I'm hoping that that becomes, like, a relevant plot point later where it's like, we caught the guy who's doing this. I'm going to shoot him. No, we can't shoot him. He must have brought the justice, that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. So cut to our next scene, which is now back on Federation HQ. We've got uh, Vance talking to Stamets, Saru, and Burnham, and they're explaining to him again the same thing that we just discussed for the last two scenes. Um, and they mentioned that the DMA is now moving again, and it's threatening an Akali colony on the Radvec asteroids. Um, and it's not 100% sure that it's going to hit it, but it's like a one degree change can either destroy it or it'll pass right by. So they have to evacuate. They can't risk it. Why are there times where it's 
visibly moving to where they can be able to say this may be a problem in a few hours but then it can also just vanish reappear I'm not even sure that it's moving in this case. I think its effects may just take this long to reach there kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. gravity propagates, I mean, it doesn't Normally. propagate at the speed of light. It, it does. doesn't propagate. No, it doesn't. That's the weird thing. Uh, it propagates kind of differently. It's very scientific mumbo jumbo at this point for me. But gravity can propagate faster than the speed of light because it propagates at the speed of space. Right. I mean, okay. if you uh, if you try to factor in the expansion of space, but light also increases in those rates every, to to balance it out. So technically, right. gravity travels at the speed of light. Space doesn't always function appropriately. Right, and this thing just moved a thousand light years in four point two seconds. So it's going to take. It, I assume that that's what's going on here. I don't think that the whole orb itself is just like moving around like a disco ball, mm -hmm. right, or like a bowling ball, but its effects probably take some time before it reaches something or it remember how it discharged energy once or it discharged the gravimetric waves or whatever yes. that might be what's going what has a travel time idk the thing is is in isn't real science so we really shouldn't try and apply too much to it right it just doesn't You're make right. that much sense we already talked about how they are you know free free handing it when it comes to gravitational effects yeah oh yeah yeah it's it's difficult to try and apply what we know to things that they don't even know about in the show yet, so... Right. Uh, so the big problem that they mentioned is that even before the asteroids are destroyed, the effects of it are going to render transporting and communications basically impossible, so they've got to go now. They've got a cutoff point, and uh, they've got to begin evacuations immediately. The colony itself is not a Federation member. Uh, it was in former Emerald Chain territory mm -hmm. so they're doing this as a goodwill mission doesn't matter that they're not federation we can we're the only entity big enough to help so let's fucking do it it's yeah. a very good noble federation thing definitely good like vance's pr presentation of it uh and saru asked a really good question about like what are we going to do when people realize that the dma uh is not necessarily a natural phenomenon it's going to scare people and uh, Vance answers that Rillick is already working with our planetary allies, interstellar allies, to explain this so that we can keep the people calm. Good. Well, well I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go no, I was just going to say that's good. Yeah. But yeah. Well, and I can, I get the fear, but honestly, there have been space is a dangerous place, and we've certainly seen that. And peril is almost always right around the corner. So. I, I don't know if, yes, uh, of course you wouldn't be less panicked or stressed than anything else, but I think that the way that this season has portrayed this anomaly uh, or, or even the, the burn from last season is, is that these are things that are uh, Federation ending events or, you know, will make you want to pull out of some coalition just because it's there. And to me, I would think that, well, there's been just, maybe not worse, but there have been some pretty bad things. And so it, it, it just seems like people are ready to jump ship at the first sign of, of trouble. So I'm with you with regards to the DMA. The DMA mm -hmm. doesn't seem that much scarier to me than say like the, the, the Doomsday Weapon. No, the Doomsday Weapon or the Borg. Those are both right. good, right? Yep. It doesn't seem any scarier than either one of those. But the burn, definitely scarier. The burn yes. turns off warp travel everywhere. That's that's big enough to fall apart, right? That'd be like if you took the United States and turned off electricity and destroyed all of the roads for the entire country all at once. We would fracture into city-states everywhere kind right. of thing, right? right. Like yeah. Atlanta would have no connection to Seattle, so they wouldn't consider themselves part of the same country. They they work as their own entity, right? Right. It was very much it like if, uh, if uh, big old sunstorm hit yeah. Earth and wiped out all electromagnetic and everything. Any electronic device wiped out. No telecoms, no satellites, no cell phones. We very much would all be fending for ourselves. Mad Max. Yeah, Basically, I get it for the, Mad Max. The DMA is definitely scary. The fact that it appeared out of nowhere, destroys a planet, disappears, moves somewhere else, it's pretty terrifying. Um, but it doesn't seem to be doing it, at least so far, like with malice it's not going to planets that it thinks are important and blowing up just those planets or anything it's not targeting with intelligence right the right. borg definitely did i think the borg are still scarier than the dma 
but yes. the Borg also never did we see destroy an entire planet, a uh, home world in like seconds. We never really saw that. So right, that wouldn't be their goal. No, not at all. Even if, even if they assimilated every yeah. being on the planet, then they then they dip. They're 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 not planet destroying people. They're going after the technology. Mm -hmm. So now, so we get a list of some potential uh, causes or responsible parties for the DMA, uh, according to Starfleet Intelligence. Oh, so the so list good. was, yeah, it was a good scene. Like it gave us a neat bit of like exposure to things that we haven't heard of in a while. Oh, yeah. So the Metrons from TOS, yep, uh, who were the people who like look shiny and had like togas on, like half of the aliens in TOS. Uh, <laughs> the Nassim, who were the caretaker species from Voyager. Mm -hmm. Um, the Iconian survivors. Now, I think that this actually might be a small STO reference, and I don't think it's the only one in this episode, uh, because the Iconians, and as far as we know, and throughout all of Trek Alpha canon, they never did anything particularly malicious or going around blowing up stars or anything like that. They may have had the technology, but they never really did anything like that. So I think that this might be a little bit of a call out this STO. Um, well, not like the Takan did. Right, the Takan we know could move stars and planets, which I think is actually just as important. Yeah. Uh, they're not in the list, though, so they must be assumed to be actually extinct. No survivors or, kind of thing. Or they're just left off the list <laughs> to not give it away. Because if they can move stars and planets, then then a hypergiant shouldn't be a problem. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's fair. Though, though, yeah, I don't know if we'll... I don't think we'll see the Takan again. Uh, the one dude that we saw from the Takan was kind of cool. He had that cool spear thing that he twirled around with the Ferengi. I liked him. Are you <laughs> just as a sideways? Are you looking forward to Star Trek Resurgence? Because the Takan are oh, yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. No more discussion on that part, but it's gonna agree, it's gonna be great. Yeah. Okay. So, and then the last one on the list is the Q Continuum, uh, which were considered but dismissed from the list because nobody's seen them in six hundred years. Six, which I think is very interesting. Years. So it's 3189, which means no one's seen them since 2589, which is only 200 years after Picard. Yeah. Good point. The thing that I find really strange, and this is going back to your earlier point, Big J, about, like, why are people so scared? They've seen Planet Destroyers before. Right. Is a show like Lower Decks, which we know has some tongue-in-cheekness to it and is a comedy, right, treats things like AIs that conquer planets like this is this week's one we'll get to the next one next week kind of thing this is an all the time thing they probably would handle a planet destroyer with a similar kind of glibness to it they handle black holes that way which I think is great um, but here they're handling it very seriously same thing with the Q continuum the Q continuum in TNG was like oh god it's Q again mm -hmm. he's back <laughs> uh, but when it shows up on Voyager they're like oh god it's Q like serious thing again in Lower Decks, when Q shows up, Mariner's like, Q, go away. No, 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 I don't have time for your shit, go away. Right. Right? Which I right. thought was perfect, right? <laughs> like, it depends on how you approach these things. Yeah. If Q shows up everywhere in Starfleet and just annoys people that he kind of likes here and there, then okay. It makes sense that most people would react to him as like he's an annoyance. But if he only ever really hits on Picard and just ruins Picard's day and then tries to screw Janeway and then gets punched by Cisco, then he's still very enigmatic, very limited, and then most people don't have any exposure to him. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like contradictory presentations for these things. And it might just be because uh, Mike McMahon loves making references and likes trivializing some things, which I think is fine. So, I, and I I'm think Lower Decks is the perfect vehicle for that kind of attitude. Yes. Agreed. I'm interested to see what was that occasion with the Q that suddenly they're just like not interested. Know, yeah, we're they done. bounced and... to the mirror universe before the split. No, <laughs> um, I had uh, a thought about that as well. Like the, the another reason why it's taken so dramatically serious here is Quay John just earned its freedom from the the chain a few months ago, and now it's gone. And how many others of these of these people who have no, only known you know, basically a wretched existence for the last hundred so years during the burn, how many of those people are now going, we just earned our freedom, the Federation's coming back, hope is here, and now there is this completely mind-boggling threat that is wisping planets out of existence without even realizing it. And now it can travel a thousand light years in four seconds. That, that kind of growing up in that kind of way and now suddenly realizing we just earned our freedom and this thing can just wipe us out and and we would be forgotten all of us that is an existential threat yeah 
Speaking of being forgotten, the species that lives on these uh, Radvec asteroids is, is are the Akali, which we last saw in Enterprise as a pre-warp civilization. The, the little dingy little thing. Oh my thingies. god, yeah. that's yeah. right. I thought they looked familiar. Man, that's, yeah. that's good. Yeah, it's a, it's a great callback, and they have the same makeup. They didn't look crazy different. It was mm -hmm. It's a good callback to it. And I just like the fact that, you know, from Enterprise's time to this 32nd century, they've clearly become more capable. They clearly had expanded some, and then the burn and the Emerald Chain messed with them, essentially messed with their development, but they had progressed. They weren't still stuck on just their one lonely shitty planet that even yeah. Archer didn't seem to like. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, you know, cool. I, so, the other oh, discussion that he was having there was, it, I started to feel like Stamets was getting a bit of the relics treatment from from uh, Admiral Daddy over there. Um, Stamets yes. was like, wait, you're replacing me? But I have all I need. He's like, no, we need experts in all of this technology. And it was just a flat statement. He didn't say, you're not qualified. He was just like, low-key, we, we need topper minds than you have. And Stamets has to go from being the toppest mind to being run-of-the-mill. And that had to be hard for him, but I think it makes total sense. We're a thousand years later. Your top-ass mind is now run-of-the-mill. That's yes. perfect. I don't even think he's saying that you're run-of-the-mill. He's just saying, like, so we asked the Navarre Science Academy, and they're out of ideas. You haven't made this enough progress. Let's give somebody else a shot, and I'm going to press gang Ruan Tarka into doing this. Yeah. I don't care what he's working on before. This is more important now. Well, and if you, if you have someone that has the experience and the knowledge and may be able to help, you can't not do that just because you have this, I, I want to say he's e egotistical. Stamets has always come off to me as having oh, yeah. the big ego, <clears throat> dare I say even some narcissistic tendencies about himself. He's like the, the top column A, column alpha D. dude. It, right, yeah, yeah. And so for someone to get assigned to to help him, there was nothing I heard Admiral mm -hmm. Vance say that implied that he's going to be your boss. You report to him. Oh yeah. He outranks you. It was just there's going to be a, a teamwork here. But Stamets, like like anything else, if if you even make him think that he is not basically the traveler level or Q right. level <laughs> intellect, then you, you've offended him. You know he he, he can't yeah. take that. He's no, it's all accurate. He has grown a little bit, but he definitely began the ser the show as I am I am the law, do what I say or die. Right. Yeah, yep. I agree. Yeah, though I do think it's interesting that the guy that they bring in is the guy who's been heading the spore drive uh, upgrade and development project. I don't know if that experience is particularly relevant for the DMA. Let's, that'd be interesting to find out. Maybe the DMA is some sort of manifestation of like the spore space, right? Or the Josep or something along those lines. Who knows? We Gosh, don't know enough wouldn't yet. That be, but... Wouldn't that be incredible if just spore space had tunneled through from something they did a thousand years ago and is now, you know, drawing on the power of the mycelial network to, to do its little search? Yep. Uh, we scary. also get a good reference here about the. Uh, the character Aurelio, who's been working with uh, Ruan Tarka on developing the new spore drive. Aurelio, if you don't remember, was the Emerald Chain human mm -hmm. who was the one who was like trying to hack Stamets's brain and take control of Stamets to use the spore drive for the Emerald Chain. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was all very interesting. I'm glad that the guy is actually, you know, being put to good use. Um, the actor Kenneth Mitchell is one of those like heroic types. So it's good that even a reference to him comes around. Yeah, he's a cool guy. Well, he also played um, uh, first season of Discovery. Yeah, he was a Klingon. Uh, um, what was the? Oh my God, what was the Klingon's name? I swear. Tanavik. He was Cole and Tanavik in. Cole. Yeah, Cole. Right. right. Thinking right. too. Yeah, Cole. Way to go, he, dudes! He yep. was also a voice actor on Lower Decks. He was like the Twirk captain and like other things too. So <sighs> okay. he's been all around Trek since since Discovery season one. And uh, yeah, he's really awesome. He's suffering from ALS, like he's in the generous states for it. Yeah, and like that. that was why they changed what roles he could play. But he still wants to be involved in anything he can. Oh, yeah. So mm -hmm. very cool. And that's why Aurelio had that badass chair. Right, the floating chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so Anyways. we cross over to was it Burnham and uh, Burnham and Book? Mm-hmm. We get our Burnham and Book scene where like. 
as usual, Burnham is trying to calm Book down, right? About let's not go so gung ho. We will figure this out. Clam, right? Like clam is important here. So they're going to start by saving lambs on Radivac Five, and you know we will figure this out. And Book just needs to do something. This mm -hmm. like drive to be involved in things. Well, it keeps him. I, it, it keeps his mind off of what's happened. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, because he's still going through a, a big loss. So, the more he keeps himself busy and engaged, and having something to direct that anger to, it's better than sitting around in his in his quarters. Because <clears throat> th this isn't this isn't TNG. This is not. Okay, this planet exploded in this episode. Next episode, everyone's cool. Right. Like like nothing happened. Um, these are things that are that are dealt with, episode to episode, and he's he's still, to me, in that same mindset of. I need to keep myself busy, which, again, it's like the only thing you can do because you're you're not, you don't have someone to hunt down. Not a bad guy, not a not boss, yet. not a bounty hunter. Right, right. So. But no, I'm with I, you. I'm with you. No, so I, the, I do enjoy the tender moments between book and mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. It, it shows both of their acting skills really well, right? Like, it shows that they care about each other, and they're both they're selling me on this relationship. Like, it it it, it works. It, it makes sense. Uh, Burnham is clearly doing her best to just... Right. Help. Look. If if this had been a TNG episode, they would have walked from Vance's office, gotten on Discovery, done the black alert, and the next thing you'd see is either a captain's log or they're just beaming down to the surface or taking that shuttle down to the surface. This isn't TNG. We're right. showing relationships, dynamics, growth, struggle, and that's real. And and I love that we're getting you know, connected to these characters in a very different way than we were ever connected to the classic five. So neat thing happens next. Rather than, you know, take a turbo lift back up to the bridge, they just teleport up and they get a status update. Sounds like they already have three Federation ships that have reached Radvec five, which is great because, you know, the more ships there, the more you can evacuate at once. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, and so you know, Burnham starts letting the crew know, informs everyone that, hey, we're going to be taking on refugees, it's an evacuation mission, prep shuttle bays to hold people, etc. All the stuff that we've seen the Enterprise D do before. Then they spore drive over to Radvec, and we see that even more ships are arriving and leaving as they arrive right. to take people. I like, and, uh, so I like that we get the... Uh... The captain's speech that we made fun of in that one episode of Lower Decks, where all the red shirts were like, "We're gonna make cool speeches." Like, guys, we have to actually do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, we had, I think, with with Reese volunteering his, the, the am, am I jumping too? too You're quick? jumping yeah. ahead a bit because okay, okay. here's the one thing I want to bring up. It's my big yeah. criticism of this episode, and it drove me crazy the entire time. This entire colony has 1,200 people on it, right? Right. Discovery is not a small ship. They already have three other Starfleet ships. Why is it taking them four hours to evacuate 1,200 people? 1,200 people is a small middle school where I'm from, right? Yeah. The Enterprise D, D as in the Galaxy class, had an evacuation capacity of 15,000, according to the TNG tech manual. Right? right. I even dug mine out to make sure that I wasn't talking out my ass on this one. Right, right. right. 15,000 right. with a capacity to evacuate 1,000 people per hour, right? Mm -hmm. One ship alone, and their transporters were a lot slower than Discoveries. We've seen that over yes. and over right, again. Right, right. And Why they didn't is it have, taking so long? And they didn't have a cavernous turbo lift system like the Discovery has. I mean, they could have <laughs> fit everybody just in there in this magical Hermione's purse thing that's, that's on Discovery. And you're right, the, the transporters are much faster. Why is it taking this long? They should have been... They even say that they have a capacity for 40 people at a time with the transporters, right? That should let you get through, you know, tons of people real fast. Because you don't have to beam them to the transport room and let them walk off the pad. Right. They don't do that anymore in Discovery. Beam them to the shuttle bay so let's or say, whatever converted cargo so bay you're using. 40 people an hour? No, not 40 people an hour, 40 people per per cycle, I guess. Right, per cycle, so let's and say, about 1, let's say a cycle lasts five seconds, 
just right. for just to expand that out a little bit. Uh-huh. Everybody's pulling out their calculators now, but if yep. you can beam up forty people every five seconds, that's two. Well, and we're uh, that's like a lot. <laughs> twelve. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. I, I did. I did twelve hundred yeah. d- divided by forty, so that's thirty cycles. At five seconds a cycle. At five seconds a cycle would be one hundred fifty get... seconds. So it's three minutes. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it should have been freaking done in three minutes, and they had three ships. At least three ships. There were three ships that were already there when they got there. Who knows how many more showed up over the next four hours. So That's ridiculous. Yeah, it should not have been that big of an operation. Exactly. Here's the exceptions I'll give. Maybe it's because people had to, like, grab some belongings, but then we know that people were walking around the ship without anything because the girl brought nothing. Well, and we also know that these people had already evacuated to evac zones. Yep, because yeah, those ready anyway. to go. Those other six folks were the outliers. <laughs> yeah, they were ready to go, right? So this this whole premise to me is way too small scale. Give me two extra zeros on the number of colonists or the number of citizens yeah. there, and then it makes more sense. Then you need a massive number of ships to pull people off of it. Yeah, and people it, each get, cycle. So if it's if we're talking three minutes for twelve hundred people. Multiply that by 10, that's 30, still not enough. Multiply that by 10, that's 300 minutes, and we have a four, we have four hours to do that. That's, now there becomes a rush. That's a push. Right. That's a so push. So that goes from having 1,200 colonists to having 120,000 colonists, right? Mm, right? That's a huge fucking jump. But my point is, the numbers are too small to yeah. impress me on this one. So, like, it seems real small scale to me. You know, like maybe maybe it was because they weren't all grouped together in one place, and the ships actually had to like target lock to different sites. Because you're looking at these these asteroids, and That's you guys, stable. I don't know if you guys can see them, but the the audience yeah. can see them, and we can see there's these little green areas of force field, which is presumably habitat. It's a bunch of asteroids. There's these cables tethering together. Um, you know, there, there might be interference. There are, you have to actually pilot to within range of one of these places. We're already, we already know that, that interference from the DMA is going to cause some problems later on. Um, and we also don't know the state of these other ships. Are they just flying in because they're the closest ones in range and they haven't had a refit in 50 years? But yeah, it's a thousand I mean, years later. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, I just have some expectations here. Like, the numbers are just too small scale. Now, yeah. I can make some exceptions for things, right? This isn't the end of the world. It just seems a little small fry to, like, to take that long and to freak people out this way. Right? Well, and the, the other thing I was just sitting here thinking about, because we're talking about how, how quickly transport happens now, I wonder if the sacrifice to that is... You can do that with smaller groups. There could be a longer recharge time. So it's longer in between, but then when you do do that transport process, it's you know, it's like that. But for it to be that quick, you'd have to assume it takes a whole lot more power than what we're used to in twenty fourth century standards. So a cycle may be a whole hell of a lot longer than when we've seen just two or three people transport. I don't disagree. The only evidence that I would have to counter that would be in Star Trek Picard, where they have these portal transporters on the facilities at Starfleet Academy and Starfleet Headquarters, where people are just walking in and out of those things on a regular basis. Now, sure, those things might be tied into a central power grid planet side. Okay, that's, you know, arguing for and against and stuff like that. Um, But we know that the transporters were being considered a priority system by Saru, when they were trying to run the experiment that we're going to get to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just overall, I just feel like... The numbers didn't scale. <laughs> yeah. it's, it didn't scale well, this operation. Yeah, yeah, the whole operation could have been done by the Enterprise-D in, like, an hour at the Enterprise's... An hour and a half, to be generous, at the Enterprise-D's tech level. Right, and it would have it, yeah. it would have been a Ensign so and Ensign Ricky, take the con, I'm taking a nap, beam these people up. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be All in right, my cool. room. So now we can go on to the whole, like, how they're doing the evacuation um, after the intro. And that's, this is where we get Reese is like, I want to be involved. I want to help this. And we get a little bit of background about Reese, which was nice. And what I was going to say earlier was 
I, I think that that's the most we're going to get out of having someone outside of that that main cycle of the cast getting any screen or background time it, it's i think that tops out right there um and we had uh, the substitute for the communication station again you know, nielsen the, well uh, we also no, no, didn't not have nielsen, not, not nielsen the um the the oh, guy the who's bryce taking bryce. Bryce. bryce yeah the bryce they replaced. Said his yeah, name. The, the, i can't remember substitute what it is. bryce we also did not see a wosakun or detmer this episode there were two no. other people um, a very interesting alien at Ops. Which I like. I like the fact that there are duty shifts and people yeah. just, this isn't today's, their days, their Saturday or something, right? right. Like, and this is a pretty ho-hum mission from their perspective. It's important, but there's nothing like that requires a high-duty high, high duty pilot or something. They might very well just be on leave. Yeah, or they may have I taken just, the week. I, I, think the, I think the budget, they had to uh, skim a little bit since they were graced by Jet Reno's presence. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is the first time that they actually included Tignataro like in the intro credits too. It was yeah. like a with Tignataro too. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, like nice of you to show up. I love Tig. <laughs> <laughs> so we're back so, on Discovery. Back on Discovery. Uh, here's where we get the revelation that there are six people who are outside of the evacuation zones, and uh, the magistrate, the Akali magistrate, literally goes. They're the examples. They're prisoners. They're not coming. Uh, they're criminals. Six offenders. They're not coming. Right? Like, this is emerald chain tradition. It keeps things in line here. And uh, Book is, like, the most annoyed by this. <laughs> He's like, the Book is like, you are. <laughs> are you kidding? And why, why did he make it such a big deal? Why was it such a, a big deal to him? To the Akali because guy? he just lost his planet? Or to Book? <sighs> to Book. Oh, because nobody else made it off his world. He is the last of his people. That we know but of. But they're not the last sure, six. that's true. No, they won't, but he was the only one who made it off, and he feels guilty from that. And so, sure, everybody else is taken care of, but the people who need it the most are not. That's yeah, what that's I took the away. measure of a, That's, what that's I mine, away. too. There's this great quote. I don't, I'm not going to say it correctly, but it's something on the lines of, the measure of a great society is how it treats the least fortunate among it. Right. Right? Yeah. So in this case, the Federation is the great society, and the least fortunate are those that would be left behind. So they are putting in the effort to get them. It's a very Star Trek thing. There's nothing more Star Trek than, like, you have to take your prisoners with you when you're evacuating. That's super in, in the vein of Star Trek. Um, the fact that, you know, the captain is the one that's personally going to go do it is a little out of left field, but this is the Michael Burnham show, so it makes sense. It is. And yes. we did see that really cool post that sort of framed it from, you know, Michael is Michael is the captain. She feels the weight of everything on her shoulders. So, of course, she is deeply involved in a lot of these things. And again, yep. came like we say, just about every time she does stuff like this, she came from the cowboy days of Starfleet. Sure. And I love the that. captain's not going to sit on the bridge during stuff like this. They're going to be right in the thick of it. Oh, did you guys catch that Linus was back too? We finally saw yeah. Linus yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, I was so happy Linus. about that. If you're watching it right now on the YouTube, he's right over Burnham's shoulder in this little screenshot. But yeah, overall, a really good bridge scene. Everybody kind of played their roles. The banter back and forth between Book and Burnham was great. Like it's like referencing their year, their time as like careers. So yeah. all good there. Right. Uh, and cut to next scene which is a very good touching scene between Stamets and Culbert. Yeah. Where they're both like trying to vent about their day. Uh, and Stamets is like, I get to meet Ruan Tarka, finally. I've been trying to get him to talk to me for forever. And he's always too busy. I saw him going to put on a clean jacket for him. <laughs> like the one he was wearing wasn't clean. I mean, they are in a very sterile, I, I don't know. I mean, are you, you know, telling I... me you've never changed shirts just to go meet someone new? like for a date even though your current shirt was probably fine you mean if it was an identical shirt or just like a different with, shirt well that's that's different like uh yeah i would put on instead of wearing a t-shirt or something i'd put on nice button up yeah there's that but you're you talking about t-shirts but it, for an identical one I, i'm not talking like i would go from a t-shirt to something that's it's totally different like it, it's it's not from for example i'm wearing this shirt and 
I want to go meet someone, it would be like if I took this one off and put an exact duplicate on. That's what Stamets did to me. But, but, you've, been, dirty. but you've been wearing that shirt all day and you want to, you don't want to. No, I've only been wearing it for like an hour. I just, I put this stuff on for well, a podcast. Okay, I don't you, walk but, around in this. See, and I was on the other side of the like scope. It. I was like, I thought, I thought the uniforms were just self-cleaning programmable matter by now. So changing a jacket was really weird. He's getting the wrinkles out, Dag. That's all. Self-cleaning matter programmable matter. Wrinkles. Yeah. <laughs> all right. It's so static anyways, free. This is where I'm sure dryer sheets still exist in the 30 <laughs> yeah. seconds. Stamets, Stamets decides to vent a little here, where he's like. I've been trying to help them with things. The staff has talked to me. I talk to Aurelio all the time, but like, he, no professional courtesy from this one. How can I work with him? And uh, Culber gives him the like very practiced "let it roll off of you" response that a therapist will give you. Uh, and then he tries to run away to go work with the evacuees. And Samus is like, "Wait, hold on. Give me ten minutes, bro. You've been working for like you've had five sessions today. Right. Relax a minute." And uh, Culber can't. Yeah. Well, I can, there's a, it, because what, what Stamets was doing, yes, is important. He's still trying to figure out the DMA thing, but Colbert is working with a team that's dealing with the immediate here and now. We've got to get these people, these 1,200 people off this, this asteroid because for some reason we decided it takes a hell of a lot longer than it's supposed to. Well, to me, that's kind of more of a, an urgent situation right now. The, the DMA research is sure it's important, but you know they've they've got to get these people off right now. So no, I don't have a couple minutes to sit around and talk. Yeah, I mean it's also Culver hiding himself in his work as as we discuss later in the episode. Yep. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm with you. I can see why Stamets wants his partner, his husband, to like, dude, breathe, right? Like catch your breath. You'll be better at your job if you catch your breath first. But I can also see why Culver's like. Nope, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. So yeah, it yep. was um, it was the most out of character I felt Colbert has been all season, and then sort of and then got they that, explain it, and then I got that flipped around on me later. It was like, oh, he's actually been out of character the whole season, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get to that shortly. Yeah. So our next scene is Ruan Tarka arriving on the bridge, uh, and he just is an asshole from the moment he gets there. He is crass. He is undiplomatic. He insults people like without even a care or a thought to it. Uh, I think he's probably coded a little bit neurodivergent uh, on purpose, uh, which is interesting. So um, he and Stamets should get together like right. I got solid like, Stamets, like, this, like classic tight. Stamets vibes from him. Like Stamets is now going to be faced with himself. Opposites yes. attract, uh, likes repel. So I think that they're just going to repel each other anytime they're not actively working on something. Probably, okay. yeah. Uh, what I will say is I caught that he was arising from like the first moment because of the little tattoo on the forehead and I loved it because every rising we've seen as he calls out later in the episode is literally just a hedonist on the planet of sex and fun and this guy is just like I'm here for the science (laughs) that shit's stupid that shit doesn't matter let's do some science and I thought that was a fun thing because now we have an example of a person from Ryza who is not you know wearing skimpy clothing and trying to fuck first person from rise that's not a sex fiend basically and doesn't right? have you know walking around with an umox thing or whatever the hell it was uh horgon yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's horgon. just nice that the, that rise is now no longer a complete planet of hats right it's no longer just the planet that has only produced one thing ever it makes hats right now they've got a brilliant scientist that came out of there as well yeah hats okay it's it's a term from tv trips yeah <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so it was a good scene. Um, he also like straight up insults Stamets like as soon as they talked. Uh, much to admire in your work, much to improve. Yeah. So it's like, and the the acting on Anthony Rapp's face is just like, oh, this bitch. Yep. It was great. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Anthony Rapp's reactions to this. There are so many gifts that should be made from this. <laughs> That I'm not going to be able to see that scene the same way now. Yeah, and it, it then there's the scene where they're walking off the bridge and he comments on, like, Saru's feet. You really do have the strangest yeah. feet. It's, like, very crass. Like, excuse Again, it's me? Just, um, <laughs> yeah. It's just, uh, what is it? Um, 
I don't know, lacking Isn't there... lacking the filter. It, yeah, like isn't I said, there I, actually a metal might be... term or there, there's a term for just you know someone who just doesn't no filter. I thought that there was something actually I don't want to diagnose the guy, but I think yeah. he's supposed to be coded as neurodivergent. I think he's supposed to be coded as like an autistic person that okay. just doesn't have a filter or something. Like I think oh. that's how they kind of kind of try to portray him. I don't know if that's intentional or not, but that's the vibe I get from it. Hmm. Um, and it is an hmm. interesting take. It's see, and I would step like... back from making any kind of diagnosis, not because I don't agree with you, but because I'm not qualified to even right. go there that's and fair. say anything about that. But I've done well, my research fair. on Facebook. I'm qualified to pretty much say whatever the hell Welcome I want. Welcome to the and... Beyond Facebook podcast, where we're right all the time, and any news you watch is not us. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's not so... news, it's just entertainment. Anything more on this scene, or cut, or cut to <laughs> no. the, uh, the... To the, the prison. prison. Cool, cut to the prison. So they're walking up to a cool, shimmery green force field, which I love the look of, and they're just scanning away as you do, and that's the uh, shield-blocking force field and comms interfering force field, and they meet up with Bryce, and uh, they've only beamed up 160 people so far, so they are four cycles through. They mean uh, Reese. Or Reese, you're right, sorry. Yeah. To Reese, and they're only four cycles through and beaming people up, so they are taking their time. And uh, here's <laughs> where we get this fun background on why Reese is so gung-ho on this mission, why he's taking charge of it, and it's a good reason. On whichever planet he lived on, the town that he lived in, uh, his entire village got destroyed or his entire city got destroyed by a hurricane mm -hmm. and uh, Starfleet were the ones that showed up and saved them and this is back in the 20 sec 23rd century so that's very much on brand much more so, much, long time before the weather net well it probably oh, wasn't on earth yeah. I'm not assuming it was on earth but oh well I kind of went with that you know um, one thing I really loved about the planet description here is the placement of this of this asteroid, um, you know, facing away from the sun, it gave it the perfect angle to emulate those those classic gradient surroundings that were featured in Star Trek: The Original Series, where you just had like green to dark green, or purple to dark purple, or blue to dark blue, and it was just that was the background of this set. And then rocks everywhere, rocks on everything. Let's do Galileo 7's rocks, or the, the, the Spock's brain rocks, or the other rocks. It's just planet rock, and so I thought this was a really cool callback. And why was right it so close to, their, to the star in that system? I mean, to me, that looks closer than frickin' Mercury to our sun. Isn't there going to be a problem that's... It's not in the habitable zone, and yet... We That's have, what we technology have is for. Force fields? Well, I'm stretching here, but again, gravity situations, I'm just like, all of them, they're incorrect. Right. But they're artistic. They're pretty. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it, all it, it is. I think it's just artistic license on it. Supposed to, yeah, and, it's supposed to be pretty. Yeah. And they've got technology that we know can handle it. We have Starfleet ships in the 24th century that can just hang out in the fucking Corona for hours on end. Right? So yes. that's wild. So we have metaphasic shields around these things. Yep. A thousand years improved. And yep. sure, your little asteroid conduit thing, you know, debris can sit next to this star. That's fine. But it's going to take us four hours to beam up 1,200 of your people. <laughs> <laughs> right? It just doesn't. It boggles. It boggles. Okay. Uh, now, I will say that the prison itself is really cool looking. It looks like something straight out of uh, Cyberpunk or out of, like, Blade Runner. Like, it's got Whoa. this real industrial pyramidal look to it and some floating bits, even. Big fan. Uh, and here's where they walk up and find that Narissa beetle thing that is really cool. But they're... But they're not real. Right. They're yeah, they're, they're little heat-seeking walking landmines. And I was like, oh, shouldn't landmines be outlawed by some kind of accord by now? You think the Emerald Chain follows the Geneva Convention? Right, yeah. The, the, the Emerald, Emerald Chain, Chain pretty has much... even heard of the Geneva Convention? I, probably by not. this point, probably none of them have. <laughs> no one in, in Starfleet <laughs> or on Earth. Geneva? Where's Geneva? Right, we get, right, none yeah. of us have been to Earth in a hundred years. We, we know we know the Kittimer Accords and the uh, Treaty of Alderaan and some of those big ones, but uh, yeah, mines and... To me, I think that is a brilliant idea. Yeah, of course you would take these 
now were they they weren't um were these were these manufactured or uh well because it's it's an ai or were they started maybe as real beetles and then they they kind of quote unquote assimilate them or totally went for the transformer angle yeah. Like they, they were like little landmines that popped up to be bugs that turned into little General Grievous star sh- little escape ship saw, wheels. circular saw things. Yeah. You know, it looked exactly like the weapons from the aliens in the Battleship movie, which I know is a shitty movie, but they had these giant red blade things that would slice through like highways and through ships and such. Huh. Aliens? No, battle, the the battleship. battleship movie. Oh, battle. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah Battleship. Yeah. See, and exactly. I, I yeah. went for the the Tron discs. I get that too. You're little right. A little From bit of vibe Legacy. there, but I haven't seen the Battleship movie, so. Oh, definitely set aside some time it. for it with like a bowl of popcorn and some drinks. It's yep. pretty terribly funny. Rihanna is the best actor in it. Reco- I am recommendation um, accepted. Cool. All right, so they pick up that the bug itself is acting kind of funny. It's gone the exact same path four times back and forth. Real suspect. Things in nature probably don't do that, according to them. Uh, they shoot at it, and it blows up like a landmine. And then she starts hacking the grid. Back to a Tron reference, uh, <laughs> which is great. We hack the this planet! Hack the planet! Hack the planet! We cut so, back to... I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I was just going to say real quick, th- this program will programmable matter thing probably one of my favorites you need a phaser just right there need a hud to go boom right you know, there i'm not sure if that's programmable matter or so the hud i'm pretty sure is not programmable i'm pretty sure the hud is just holograms but i'm not right, sure from that's the communicator the, right i think that what they're doing is not with programmable matter i think it's a transporter buffer really so like yeah. an inventory box mm-hmm. like from like resident evil game. you've got your wait okay they have mm-hmm. the they have the quantum storage system that they used in picard where they just and you can be like all right i need my giant thing and you open up the thing and it comes out very much like your uh hermione bag or your mary poppins so bag if you ever artist. played star trek Elite force right yep. the, the video game they work the same way they had a transporter buffer that would store your whatever guns you had uh and th- then you just disappear into the transporter buffer, pull out a new one, and it just essentially materializes in your hands. Sort of how these do. I'm not sold that they're that they're programmable matter for one reason. People have different guns. Book's gun is clearly a Quajon gun, but he's yep. using a Starfleet badge to get it. Whereas yep. Burnham's is very much a Starfleet phaser. If they're using these as programmable matter from Starfleet things, I'd expect that they would only give you Starfleet guns. Unless you have a range of aesthetic that you can program into your weapon. I don't know. Starfleet Plus, has standard issue. Well, I would think that you'd only go to get Starfleet weapons out of it. But I don't know. This is very when you, when you, when you get to the point where you can three D print anything, patterns become the currency of of du jour. So that's that's where I was thinking about it. I had this conversation offline a while ago about once you can have a replicator, we're just going to start trading in patterns. Yeah, I don't disagree with you there. We need to do a special episode on replicators at some point. All right. Patterns are the are like the money, the uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. So our next scene is uh, Stamets trying to run uh, Ruan Tarka through his research and his findings, and Tarka's just like, "Yeah, I already read this. This is like one of those classes in college where the professor's literally just reading the slides on the on the PowerPoint. Nobody likes those classes. He's clearly already read the slides. So like, let's actually talk about it. And that's what he starts to do. It obviously annoys Stamets." And it clearly shows that Saru is annoyed by him too. Like, Ruan Tarka is rubbing everyone the wrong way, but he does show insight with his analysis really quickly. Uh, so he gets mashed potatoes from the replicator uh, cold and like a pea to demonstrate what he's talking about. Did I see uh, steam coming off those? The mashed I, potatoes if when you it did, was. They were cold. I, I didn't see any steam. I was looking for it too. Maybe, maybe it was I could have swore maybe right. there's multiple variants of the episode out there I, yeah I don't know I got the impression that Stamets is your exemplar of your theoretical physicist who needs the math to line up and mm. I can't remember the other guy's name you've said it like five times the, 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 the Tarka Tarka just go Tarka Tarka, Tarka. 
All right, so Tarka. Tarka's your applied physicist. He's the one who's like, okay, 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 math, whatever. Let me put this together and see what happens. Yes. Yeah. I can see that. I can see that for sure. I mean, so if you look at something like the, the, the Manhattan Project, they had both kinds of physicists on there. They had some whose entire job was just make sure that we don't ignite the atmosphere. Go do math. Like that was some people's job. Then there were other people who was like, okay, so these blocks, if we have enough of them, we'll go boom. Find out how little we need. Like change the shapes, arrange them in certain ways, add mirrors to things, and just go do it. Oh, no, there's no math for this. We haven't invented it yet. Right? right. Mm -hmm. So like they had both kinds, and that's usually how you solve problems, having both approaches at once. Yep. That being said, uh, the theoretical physicists that just did the math, nobody died in those groups. Of people who are just arranging uranium blocks together, there were several people who got radiation poisoning from drilling it. So, and some died in later experiments. So it's a very serious thing. There's, if you want to know more about this, look up the Doom core. Like it was an actual uranium core that like multiple times just killed people because they arranged things around it wrong. Jesus. Yeah, wow. real scary stuff. Rip. Anyways, uh, so we've got the two types here. Uh, and then Ruan's like, you know what? We can just sit around doing math or we can try this thing I already invented before even coming to create a DMA. Uh, just give me power. So a mini DMA just right here in the ship. That is, so it's a simulated model, but it's actually a working I don't down know to if it's scale simulating it. I think of, it's just miniaturized. Right, not really, right, I'm sorry, not simulated. It was miniaturized. So it's just as dangerous as the real size thing. It's just smaller. Yeah, and it's, what did he say towards the end of the episode? It's like 0. 0.32 times 10 to the negative nine times 17. smaller than the actual. Oh, 17? Some, yeah, some like made up freaking. Yeah. 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 Oh, not that's a real well, number. It's just well, really yeah, something. I little. mean, it's a really tiny number, but but the, it serves the greater purpose of when we get there, saying this whole ship couldn't support it, and that thing is three light years across, and it's fine, and that's yeah. where they get the uh, the hypergiant hypothesis. Yeah. Anyways, so they agree that they're going to try it. Stamets is one that has to convince Saru because Saru is generally against the idea, and. Uh, they need to go find a bigger room. So we cut back to the prison. Uh, Book is shooting at the moving landmines, and uh, the hacking continues. And here's where they start firing those like spinning red discs that I mentioned that look a lot like the ones from Battleship. And they I, are cutting through rocks. The, were, you, they, they were, were they firing them or transforming into them? Because I got the they were firing shoot, them. Boof, kind of thing. Well, yeah, they came yeah. up out of the back of the thing, but they, they came out and then ah. shot. They didn't transform into them. I thought they were just like transforming it. Okay, that's cool. There's definitely something weird about them though too, because they definitely come up and then they expand and grow kind of weirdly, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, programmable matter magic. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And then you know, just as they're running out of time and you start seeing like the rock starting to glow in front of Burnham, meaning that the thing's about to come through, she turns them all off and they all just kind of like plop over on their sides. So they march towards the prison, then they get inside the prison. And now we've got a great scene that shows exactly what we're working with here. It is six cells in a room, very small cells, like barely enough space for a bed and to stand. Yeah. So very limited. And cruel. Like, yeah, for sure. Like, I'm really surprised that the people that we, they show here have like the muscle mass that they have and they haven't atrophied from just sitting in a six by six cell all day. Well, no just privacy. Do, do push-ups. If there's enough room to stretch out and do your push-ups, you probably like jog a lot. I don't think yeah. you'd have room for it, Big J, for sure. No, they couldn't put me in one of those. <laughs> no. Jay'd be like, I'm just like gonna the... push through this force field. Give me like eight minutes. Ow, this ow. this bed here, can I get a king size? A California <laughs> king. <laughs> oh. So interesting thing, <sighs> we get this round discussion with like the various prisoners. Of the six of them, I think only four of them ever actually get to talk and we get their names. There are two that we basically never hear from. They're just always in the background. Mm -hmm. But we kind of assume that they're in the same situation. So Burnham tells him, hey, this uh, colony is in the path of gravitational anomaly. Y'all are fucked. Probably. <laughs> we need to get you off here. And then they're like, okay, why do you care about us? Because the Federation doesn't leave people behind. Uh, I've been in here 30 years, lady. You left me behind. And here's where they explain the big moral conundrum of the episode. These people were put in prison for life 
for petty crimes, like taking a joyride in a sand crawler or stealing, uh, a, banana. stealing a banana, right? It's very Javert kind of hunting down somebody for stealing a piece of bread. Uh, just uh, very petty, small crimes, and you get life sentences. So we're set up with this, like, the, this isn't a Kali culture, this is Emerald Chain culture, and uh, it's pretty brutal, so... Well, and it does a really good job of not just like showing the dichotomy between Starfleet and them, but also, you know, the the ethos between the two. Right. You know, well, because and... they go ahead. I, I was, uh, they're they're sentenced to life sentences, not execution. So right, that, that's kind of different. Is this thing is coming? It's going to kill everyone. Yes, your prisoners that were. Uh, uh, convicted for life sentences to me that's kind of different is <clears throat> sure we can beam you up take you with us and then wherever we settle put you back in solitary again just leaving them to me seems like well that's that's not a life sentence technically now you're condemning them to execution uh, you know the death penalty that's what I was trying to uh, say the death right. penalty so this isn't the this isn't entirely based on fiction, right? When Hurricane <clears throat> Katrina hit New Orleans, uh, the Orleans Parish prison had 650 people in it, mm -hmm. and they didn't bother to try and evacuate them. They left them behind. Uh, with there were something like 650 people at the beginning of it, and at the end of it, there were 570 people who were unaccounted for. Yep. Uh, they were left behind without food, water for days at a time. Many of these people just escaped and got away essentially, but. That's the kind of thing that I consider to be like a massive, massive moral failing of government, right? Like, yes. you don't leave people behind. These people are in literally your care, right? right? You are responsible for them and you left them behind. It doesn't matter that they're prisoners, right? Like, there they're may be limited resources, but they're so, you're still responsible for them. You can't it's just not. That. It's not supposed to be. But again, if we were to use <clears throat> real world as the example, uh, especially America, we're a for-profit prison system. Well, so it's it's not like we have them to uh, re, it, rehabilitation is not even in the lexicon when it comes to not in the U.S. Uh, no, no, not not in the U.S. It, it's all about uh, incarceration, not rehabilitation. And you've also got these companies that their their profit margin is based off of we need more prisoners. Yeah, which to me that's just disgusting. It because is now you get these companies that put their hands in the pockets of. There had there have been judges caught with uh, they were sentencing just based on getting their uh, you know their cut off the top of helping supply prisons with prisoners. So that's a to me that that's that's a whole different thing. Like uh, you know, Renj, I totally agree with with what you're saying. In a in a civilized society, yes. But here, in our case, you can take America as being the exact opposite of what a oh, civilized society no would disagreement be in regards there. to that. Because right. I have two more examples I wanted to share about okay. like prisoners being abused while incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So in Alabama, this is going only a couple of years ago, this is 2017 and 2018, the sheriffs in Alabama uh, were given a set amount of money with which to provide for food and for nutrition for their prisoners uh, by the state government. They provided the absolute bare minimum, and then because there was no rule against it, they pocketed the remainder. They I bought themselves that. yachts. They bought. They paid off their houses. Right. They bought themselves and their forces new guns and such. But they didn't even have to do that. They could literally just spend it on anything they wanted. Yeah. That's ridiculous because the nutrition that these prisoners were getting were, was about a dollar seventy-five worth of food per day. I remember that. Yeah. 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 And let's, Big old scandal. Let, let's also talk about the way that we think about the incarcerated and the released. We we talk about them like they're bottom of the earth. And no one mm -hmm. ever wants to say, hey, look, we, we live in a society, and as a society, a jury of their peers, if we want to trust in that, said that this is the penance that they have to pay. They get released, they're done. That That's the penance that they paid. And we want to sit there and say, oh, but they're an ex-con. Okay, yeah, but, you know, right. 
And, and and we're we're also I'm making a lot of assumptions about the equality under the law thing, and I don't mean to you know catastrophize that to everybody. I know that there's a lot of inequality in the way the law is applied to many cases across this country, and it's foul. Um, mm -hmm. But if we want to change one aspect of how we perceive these people who are coming back into society after being institutionalized and being incarcerated, we have to say they paid the price that we as a society agreed was right. And then we just have to change a few million dollars worth of other things. So one last thing about the Alabama prisons one. Here's the other thing that's kind of ridiculous. The money that was allocated was supposed to be for like nutrition and for safety, right? Like keeping them healthy and well inside of the prisons. Mm -hmm. Most of the prisons that these people were kept in didn't have air conditioning in Alabama oh, during a the... summer. Fuck. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Going on the same topic though, we have another one of these in Arizona. Uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio oh my gosh. Uh, set up set up prison tent systems without AC in the Arizona desert near Flagstaff. What the again? Uh, it's <clears throat> because we don't have a good culture of treating our prisoners with dignity. Uh, yep. These things happen, and even when they get out, we, well, we stigmatize them. But, just as and, Zach was saying, and that's yep. that's the loophole about the Fourteenth Amendment that says. We don't have slavery unless you've been duly convicted of a crime. So now we have incentivized constitutionally this desire to convict people of crimes in order to get labor for less than you need to get it for. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, you're totally right. The U.S. has the definite problems with how it's implementing a justice system. No disagreements, I think, from anyone. No. Uh, but we had the right ideas at the beginning, and we just need to go back to some of those. And the one that I wanted to bring up is one called Blackstone's Ratio. So he's an English commentary jurist, right? William Blackstone. And his thing was, it is better that 10 guilty persons escape than that one innocent person suffer. The idea being that it's better for our laws to be too permissive than too, than too oppressive every time, was his argument, right? Yeah. And this was written in the 1760s, so it was before the U.S. Constitution was written in the 1780s. And mm -hmm. when they were in the Constitution, and this is documented in Federalist Papers and inside of like the minutes from the meetings, they don't they didn't just bring up Blackstone's principle. They argued about it. They argued about being like, well, 10 is obviously bullshit. We should be talking about 100 guilty people going free for one innocent person unjustly suffering. No, no, no. A hundred, man? A thousand. And they kept upping this because they weren't talking about it being like Blackstone's ratio being too permissive. They were like, Blackstone didn't go far enough. Those are the ideas that our founders started this country with that like our justice system should be, should never punish the innocent. And we find ourselves in a situation that is very different. So I'm not always the biggest guy to go with like, oh, the founders were right. We need to remember the founders and what they did for our country, right? They're, yeah. they're the right ones. On this one, they're more right than we are now. Yeah. They are, they are. It reminds me of a photo I saw online. It was, I think, either Norway, Sweden, or Finland. One of those civilized first world countries there, and they showed what it looked like, the room for someone that was, quote unquote, incarcerated or, or whatnot. It looked like a dorm room. Yeah. It was You're nice, right. civilized dorm room they weren't treated like animals because they want to rehabilitate you they don't want to incarcerate you and then when they let you go say okay you have to get a job but we're going to make sure that you are labeled and red flagged as a convicted felon or something we want to make it still hard on you even after you served this time in prison where you were probably innocent anyway but you right know, well it. that's the we thing right in there mm -hmm. rehabilitation keeps you out of jail Punishment right. leads to recidivism, right? Yes. If you look at a country like the Netherlands, small country, but it has crime, right? Yep. They have such a good rehabilitation program that they essentially, if you've committed a crime once and you spent some time in jail, you'll never go back. Even though their prisons are nice, their prisons are like hotels, and that's where the story goes. They have so few prisoners, they're decommissioning prisons and turning them and selling them to hotel chains. Wow, yeah. Like, you want to see something crazy? Look up uh, a Dutch prisons that now have <laughs> chandeliers hanging in them and lounges because they just turned them into hotels. I think I wouldn't mind being in a Dutch or Swedish prison or, or whatever. I, but, I think yeah, I that, wouldn't mind doing an episode on, like, comparing and contrasting... Justice systems? Justice systems yeah. between certain sci-fi franchises. We don't have to limit it to Star Trek and what we see in the world today. Yep. Yeah. All right. We're do we anything more we want to cover here or just like okay cool cool sorry a lot of that was just me ranting so apologies. That's good stuff. It's good. That's what we're 
that's what we're okay. about well, beyond that's beyond this, track yeah, yeah, yeah beyond no. track and, and you're going to be fired after the episode anyway so <laughs> of course I am. All right. So the fun part here is that they have to figure out how to, how to get them out of these little prison cells. And they realize that the shields are being projected by a device inside of the room above them. They just got to overheat it. So they both just sit there, set their phasers to heat and just like, and just wait until it overheats. So easy enough solution for them. Our next scene is Culber uh, having a meeting with Kovic uh, that he, that uh, Culber requested and had to schedule ahead. And uh, he's trying to get like Kovic just like, hey, let's reschedule. I'm too busy today. And Kovic is having none of that. Kovic is like, I am a very busy man. I don't give 10 minutes to most people. I'm here. We're doing this now, which is, you know, I get it. We've all had those kinds of colleagues at work. So, yes, I get it. If I blocked out the time for you, then God damn it, we're taking it. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to literally be on fire for me to just give this back kind of thing. Right. Yep. So here we have the discussion that I think Dag wants to talk a lot about because he, I think you were pretty moved by it um, because it's a very good discussion. Well, it really is. And um, one of the things that I really liked about it is, um, you know, as a, as a guy who used to be pretty toxic, who went to therapy and did the therapy group and had some people in that group who were a lot like Kovic, who were basically like, look, I'm just going to lay this on you. And the reason that they, they felt comfortable to lay it on me is first, when you're in a group like that, you're in a space where you recognize that people are gonna say things that might be provocative and you need to think about them and not act on them. And number two, as you get to know each other's ways and moods, you start asking for permission to be like, hey, look, you're seeming a little resistant here. Can I be upfront with you? Can we, can we enter this conversational space? And even in my personal life with friends and family, I like to offer them, hey, there's a space for you to be frank if you need it. Um, and, and I don't want to be a reactionary person anymore. So I offer that space up front because for me, it's a weird coping skill, but if I just give consent for someone to like tear me down, it doesn't, I don't take it as personally as if somebody would do the same exact thing, the same exact way, but I didn't assent to it for whatever reason. And we can get to dig into that later. But anyway, yeah, we, uh, we find out that Colbert's not okay. And the whole time that he has been digging into other people's traumas, he's been using it to mask his own stuff. He's falling apart. Kovic is like, I've got 10 minutes to rewrite your psychology. So, you know, here we go. Um, now we're down to eight and a half. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and of course, this is all hastened by the need for writers to make the point that even if we look like we're okay, even if we look like we can help everybody else, even if we look like we're strong enough to take care of this, Sometimes we're falling apart on the inside. And Colbert's big, big tra trauma right now is that he came back from the dead. And he is desperately looking for a reason because if there is no reason, then he is a spit in the face to everybody else who's lost somebody. And at this point, on Discovery, a thousand years after all their friends, family, and anybody they've ever heard of is dead, everybody's lost somebody. And even even the people who are living after the post burn everybody knows somebody who died in the burn everybody does everybody knows somebody who's descended from somebody who died in the burn literally everybody around colber has lost somebody colber still has himself and stamets and we don't know a lot about colber's expanded family he still has the people on the discovery that he sort of become adopted as his family um but he needed to take some time to figure him stuff out his shit out and Kovic I think thankfully the writers did a masterful jo job of not letting Culver hide from this anymore and getting in his face when Culver got resistant but he's not the first person he, he certainly was not the last person to metaphysically die or literally die or whatever die and come back and especially just the episode prior now i think it was an episode or two prior he just he, he knows that uh uh picard uh, what happened to him he died and his Came essence his mind golem. was was co yeah but put a copy into a golem and so there's kind of this this immortality thing that has happened before to me him beating himself up on this like that kind of seems okay it's not actually that bad you weren't the first person that 
died and somehow came back to life in some means or another. And big surprise, look here through the uh, the history. You weren't the last one. This happened with Spock, happened with Picard. Uh, all of them had the deal with trauma when they came back, though. Like, remember, Picard essentially had ego death after he was assimilated. Then we had the family episode, which was one of the few times in TNG where they had, like, episode-to-episode continuity. And he went and just, like, relaxed and fought with his brother. They even wrestled, if I remember correctly, at one yep. point. Right? Like, yep. that's his trauma. He's definitely traumatized by it. And you can see it happen over and over again for Picard. Uh, every time the Borg come up, it's, like, clear. It's, like, he's still got PTSD from this. This is survivor's guilt for Culver, so I can see where he's having issues. Well, I never, it's, to me, Spock never came off as traumatized from He's from a Vulcan, experience. it's kind of different. Yeah, I, mean, I, I knew <laughs> someone was going to say that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, well, I, I do think he had like, it. Remember how we had trouble, like, like, remembering that, call me Jim. We're friends, call me Jim. Right. That whole thing is probably part of that, too. Just like... Well, Reacclimating to what he was. Right, and his mom even says, you know, the retraining of your mind has been in the Vulcan way, so your friends are going to be a little unaccustomed to who you are now. And the Vulcan way is very rigid, and, you know, how, how do Vulcans handle trauma? Have we really seen, you know, to Paul probably a little bit? So, um, Tuvok had a little bit, too. Yeah. They Tuvok, compartmentalize, right? Tuvok, they compartmentalize mm-hmm. stuff. Right, and they're, it's very easy for them to compartmentalize because they're trained to compartmentalize their emotions. So they deal with their stuff in a very different way. Colbert's a human. Colber is a 23rd century doctor who's now trying to take care of everything in the 32nd century. Um, there is there is something to be said, Jay, for you know general. This just kind of stuff happens all the time. You really shouldn't be surprised by this. But mm-hmm. on the flip side. Um, you know, taking it back to my own personal story, plenty of people have gone through what I've gone through and they did end up like me. This is my story. And now we're looking at Culver's story. Right. Remember right. though, Shax died and came back and he was also traumatized. Remember how like whenever they tried to get a story out of him, it was just like the black peak in the mountaintop and then the voice and then it's like- this And then you have to fight your father. Thing. <laughs> right, like it, clearly his is based on Bajoran mysticism, sure. Yeah. But the point is, the whole process was really traumatic to the point where it basically broke Rutherford when he yeah. heard it. Right. So here we've got Culber who went through this crazy thing with the spore drive space and the Jasep and then having to be re-brought back to our universe. Like, definitely fucked in the head a bit. Yeah. Uh, and now he's having to help other people who've lost a lot. Uh, I think that he's a good counselor, but maybe he shouldn't be counselor if he's this. Yeah, I mean, for God's sakes, even Kalis came back to life. He was yeah, but Kalis wasn't the same Kalis. He, he was clumped. <laughs> he didn't have the memories though, so it's not really the same person. Right. Um, yeah, no. There's there's definitely two ways to think about that. An audience, if you're listening to this, throw a comment up. Let us know on Twitter, Beyond Trek Pod. Um, what do you think about the way that Kovic and Colbert handled uh, the sudden admission that Colbert's not okay and hasn't been this whole season? Annie, are you okay? No. <laughs> well, Annie was left on a lava planet without any arms, without any legs or an arm. So, <laughs> a- Annie Kin, anybody? No? Okay. No. No. All right. That's... So, back to the. You uh... insensitive bastard. <laughs> hey, I had, right, the, so... I had the high ground. I took it. <laughs> you got me. Yep, yep. I almost choked on my ice tea. <laughs> All right, so finishing off that scene, Kovic gives him the like brutal Odyssey treatment. The uh, what's the Kalat Malat term for it? Absolute candor. Yeah, gives yeah. him absolute candor in response to this, and he looks like he's actually a little unsettled at the end of the at the end of the scene, uh, and then he goes back to work. So fast forward to the next scene, which is back in the prison. They broke the shield. People are getting out. And one of the chicks just tries to go for a run. And Bruno's like, oh, no, you don't. And I will stun you. It won't kill you, but I will stun you. Uh, Which is a great moment of, are you no better than our captors? Are you no better than the people who ran this prison? It's a very Trek kind of moment, too. I got the strongest feeling that um, the, the main guy here wasn't Akali. He didn't have the ridges that the Akali have. And I thought that no, was very didn't. interesting. Like, and, and we know that you know when you have the burn, you just live with whoever you happen to be with, so this could have totally been a human being. 
Um, Somebody I, was named Felix, right? And that's a very human name. Right. So maybe Felix. he was the Felix? No, he was Felix because they called him that when he was on the other side of the force field later. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is definitely a human dude. Um, I got I got Native American vibes. I don't know yes, if that's shared. Yes, I did too. Um, but... Um, I think, I, yeah, I got that too, but I, I think that's just probably because I've been watching Yellowstone, and so I'm certainly like tweaked on the Native American vibe. Right. And we learn yeah, a lot about... Yeah, hard to say about, if it's intentional or not, but I also got that same vibe. We learn a lot about these people, what they actually did, who they are. Very three-dimensional growth in a very short amount of time. Yeah, that's true. We've learned a lot about these characters uh, in such a short amount of time, about as much as we know about, like, Bryce Awoshikan. or Reese or Awoshikan. <laughs> or Nielsen. Uh, well, we knew Nielsen used to be a robot before she got allergic to being a robot. Now she's not a robot anymore. Boo. Right. <laughs> Boo. Get him off our podcast. All right, so cut to the next scene. I'm fine. Uh, af- sorry, no, uh, hold on. One more thing about that scene. It's just where... Uh, they ask for a guarantee or something to make sure that they're not going to end up going back to where they were. And uh, Burnham's not a diplomat, but she goes, this is for the diplomats to decide, and then cut the scene, so it's clear that there's going to be more there. If you're listening and you're like, but they're criminals, like, keep in mind, these people were imprisoned for things that were, like, today would just be like, hey, don't do that anymore, offenses. Like, I don't remember off the top of my head anything specific, but... Would they really... I mean, the way that, I mean, so we learn from them that, like, he's like, well, I'm the only one who deserves to be in Shawshank. I mean, wait, in here. <laughs> and uh, the rest of them, I I would like to believe that there was no unreliable narrator here, that the Emerald Chain really did try to set the, these, make these people an example. And the cruelty exhibited by the magistrate at the beginning reflects the fact that you you cross the line in any which way it's life that's just the way we work we don't want to take the time to figure anything else out don't get caught if you get caught it's life it took lessons from the Edo. right and so yeah i mean i don't know if wesley crusher's in here but uh some no. other <laughs> no. might have been one of the two guys we didn't see but um yeah the 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 five out of six of these people were in for petty crime, crime. petty Little petty, tiny petty. things that would have been little fines or probation or uh, public service of some kind. I think they looked up the American justice system as a model for this penal <laughs> colony. So, fun one for you, though. What about the prime directive not to interfere in the development of another culture, right? They're clearly post warp, fine, fine, I get that part, but their laws say this, right? That this is what they should do, this is how you behave. I think that the appeal to amnesty and like sanctuary makes sense, right? Which is what goes on in the next scene. But uh, shouldn't the Federation be more tolerant of the laws of other nations? Well, uh, so here's my interpretation of the Prime Directive. I'm going to go back to mm-hmm. Pen Pals. Oh, okay. So in in Pen Pals, season two, TNG, Data was writing corresponding with uh, Sarjenka. Yeah, yeah. Uh, species that was not warp capable yep. he should not have been doing the thing put the captain in a very bad position the way i interpret the prime directive is once you have developed warp which warp uh being able to uh, uh to develop warp travel is that entry point as to now when you can make that contact interact, yeah, sure. interact. the way i take it is uh once you are a species that has developed warp that then we don't go back and say well but the prime directive prevents us from rescuing you from this calamity that's coming that's not even what i'm saying though right like look at the visians in cogenitor from enterprise which transit is before there was a formalized a written down prime directive right Uh they were definitely more capable they were more advanced than than starfleet they were more advanced than the vulcans probably uh, and yet both of them were like, we can't interfere with their culture. This is the way they do things. We have to respect their laws and their ways, even though it resulted in the suicide of the cogenitor, right? I think the same kind of question should be talked about here. Like when there are other episodes in Trek too, where it's just like, listen, we don't agree with how you do things, but that's your way. We won't help you. We won't help assist your thing, but that's your mess, not ours. And then there are exceptions where captains are like gung-ho and break their rules. 
but well, but you're talking here about a, a peril, an outside force, an outside peril that they don't, they can't do anything about, and then that's where I think that the non-interference in the culture doesn't apply because there's this thing coming. You're going to you're going to die, but if the the prime directive is on your side. I if, highly, if you can, I highly think it's captain's discretion. I mean, yes, sure. I agree. Picard, yeah. Picard saved the Draymonds by doing whatever being he did to stabilize that world. Yeah. Um, in the the trilogy that opened DS9 season two, the Circle trilogy, yes. um, we learned that the Bajorans are dividing along Civil War lines on their own, even after Cisco uncovers the fact that the Cardassians are running weapons to them the uh the admiral is like it doesn't matter they don't they don't know the cardassians are doing they're already breaking apart apart their lines it's a bajoran internal matter leave ds9 get off the station we'll figure out the political ramifications later cisco breaks the prime directive and rescues everybody because he is committed to showing proof that the cardassians are influencing this and once that as happens, we'll, you know, we'll undo this thing. Um, Picard breaks the prime directive, I think, in the redemption two-parter by revealing right. that the, the, Romulans the Romulans are running weapons across. to the Duras. Yep. Um, I didn't see that as a, as a prime directive break. So the prime directive isn't just techno isn't just the don't talk to pre-warp. It's also the, right. the non-interference principle. Right. If like don't interfere with the affairs of other races kind of thing. Wasn't didn't something even happen on on Vulcan during a series where it was like an internal matter to Vulcan? They're our best ally. They already have warp tech, but it's an internal matter to Vulcan. Like oh yeah, in Enterprise, the Kirshara trilogy, right? Like those episodes. Well, the we can't really go with Enterprise because it's pre-prime directive. Sure, but it, the same. But they still talk about the same philosophy of non-interference, right? Like let people sort out their own things. Right, and imagine you know if during uh, during the events of uh, what is it, Paradise Lost, uh, Homefront, and Paradise Lost, an internal Earth matter caused the entire planet to erupt in anti-changeling freakout. Right. And if the Vulcans had just showed up to be like, hey, chill, um, that, there might, be that, that could have broken a prime directive itself because this division is happening on Earth, internal to Earth. Well, but protecting an ally is what I think makes it different. Now, the Romulans running arm supplies to the one Duras. side of a Klingon, right, one side of a Klingon civil war, to me, that that's interference right there and they're an ally so that's where i where i think that okay even if the, the prime directive did technically apply to that it, it's not really not an internal matter i mean it is an internal matter to the klingons and but the way that that i remember it with how the federation handled it was they don't get involved in the the thing with the klingons so they didn't get involved there because the prime directive applied there told them they couldn't do couldn't do that however the romulan interference part of it was not something that was applicable to the prime directive because that was not a natural course of either one's culture that that's that's interference that is arms dealing yes so big j but the klingons did not there are two know. other let's yeah exactly that's the thing Let's say that there are two people having a conversation, right? Yep. You don't know what the conversation is about, right? You don't mm -hmm. know what they're talking about. If you stand far enough away, you can't even hear it, so you don't know what's going on, right? You are right. not involving yourself in the conversation. Right. If you get close enough so you can hear one of them talking, but you can't hear the other, right? Now you know half the conversation. If you mm -hmm. start saying suggestions at that point, you are interfering in the conversation, but you don't know what's going on in the whole conversation. Same thing here. The Romulans were smuggling to one side. They were involved. They were involved with each other. When you started doing anything is when you interfered. That's when you break your rules. What rules the other two parties had about each other don't matter. Your rule is for you. Their rules are for them, right? So same kind of concept there. But I do need to push us forward because we are timing. Jesus. Yeah, we do that. But sorry. Yep. Let's keep it going. We sorry. can divide this into two episodes. It'll be like a, uh, a functional two-parter. So our <laughs> next scene is where they do the test, where 
they set up a model of the DMA. Uh, one fun thing I wanted to reference here, though, is that there's another Star Trek Online reference in this scene uh, where Ruan Tarka specifically mentions Rissian uh, Caracals and how he'd seen them on Risa. Here's the thing. They don't exist in canon, but they are fucking everywhere in Star Trek Online. They're like the giveaway pet that everybody gets a few of anytime you go to Risa. Have a Caracal. It's rainbow colored. Have this Caracal. It's got spots and moons on its face. Kind of I've stuff. got one. Yeah, they're beautiful. That's like the shtick, but now they're canon because this dude mentioned it, but they've been in Star Trek Online for like 10 years now. So, yep. yay! <laughs> uh, anyways, so besides that, here's where Ruan also talks about his whole I never understood the pleasure planet, I don't get Risa, surrounded by idiots, the place sucks, and then there's the Galileo joke, which was pretty interesting, and then they start the test. And it succeeds uh... at creating a really small DNA anomaly, and then it runs out of juice. More things I don't like about this scene. Go on. The lensing around the anomaly is what you would expect for something that was 3 AU in diameter. The lensing that you see here isn't even warping the background behind what they're looking at. Like, uh, The gravity. containment field keeps it from doing it. Okay. <laughs> no, that's not how light works. That's not how the containment force field works. Keeps it, the containment field keeps it from doing things outside. No, no I don't know. No. You're right. I think that's probably just an effects goof. I, I think it really is just them being like, hey, audience, this is the same thing. Okay, let's let's speak in a little more metaphor here and give them a pass on this. Again, if you've stuck with me through this episode, you know I have a beef with how Star Trek handles gravity. We, we've got a beef with a lot of things that Star Trek handles. I get it. I, I do, but... Now I'm hungry. Thanks, Jay. Oh, yeah, we'll I'm be... waiting for after this for food. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, well, then we gotta pick up the pace so you guys can... No, eat. no, no. Don't pace. Know. Nothing like that. New York City. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Go. Just... just so the <laughs> test runs out of juice, and Ruan Targa starts pressuring Jet to be like, give me more. No, I can take. Give me more. And it's kind of getting a little weird where she's like, okay, well, I guess I can drain the phasers for power for you. I guess I can do that too. And uh, Saru's like, how, how safe? <laughs> eh, it's like a six. Out of 10. Eh, it's yeah. out of 10. <laughs> um, I so, take that. I mean, the, the odds are probably good there. Though I don't know why he's so urgent to do it this minute. There's no reason to do it here and why to do it now. Right? Like, they could have waited until they got back to Federation HQ with more resources to do the same test. Plugged into like, the station? A, yeah. Yeah, like, you lose a day. Okay, a day is important, but it's also, like, you're risking the ship and the evacuation of these people, too. Right. Like, well, he's a crazy don't, fuck. Don't, don't throw like the baby out with the bathwater. Exactly. Yeah, but I. this is another one of those things that was, uh, like, a previous episode of Discovery where the uh, Federation president completely sidetracked, distracted Burnham from doing her thing in a mission and cost them a couple precious moments that could have saved some lives. To me, this seems like one of those situations where if you have a thing, you have a theory, you have an idea, if it could technically be performed here and now, you need to do it because we don't know if we have another day or whatever to do with this thing especially since it's so unstable so yes i get what you're saying let's do this in a better contained environment and whatnot but it's like well we may not have that so we Stamets. need to do this right now stamets you said we could do this tomorrow but the damn thing just shipped it to starfleet headquarters we don't have it tomorrow yeah. Right, no, you're right. right, you're right. There's certainly risk there, too. Which is why it makes sense ah. that they would start this research here, but as soon as they ran to the point of, like, the ship doesn't have enough power, you should have been like, okay, I need to get back to Starfleet HQ. Can one of your shuttles take me? Or something, right? Like, mm -hmm. someplace where he has access to more power. So, Hopefully he doesn't do this test on a planet, because that would be a bad idea. But right. someplace where he can run this test. Well, but then, now, now you're talking about risking more lives. He does this where else on a on a base on a planet if things go not wrong on a planet, but like yeah right, no but yeah on uh, anywhere else he would go would probably be risking more lives than being on discovery and, and i think see, so that's... so look at like mutara the uh the, the regular one science lab right or mm -hmm. was it regular one i thought it was called it was regular one uh -huh. regular one yeah. there were only like 15 20 maybe 30 people on that whole thing right that's a lot less than a 
than a starship and it was mm -hmm. bigger than reliant or the enterprise so it's got to have a good power generating capacity give them a science lab somewhere with some staff 30 people that blow themselves up is less than blowing up discovery or like an evacuation I mean, did, procedure did they have that kind of time did, did they have something already in place for probably. that but like i wasn't even worried that they were going to blow themselves up or die i was over here like wait did we kick off some kind of recursive it's not like you've been thing. reading too many books with time travel. Yes, no, I'm, I just, I, I just super non-linear, and yeah, maybe that played into it, but I was over here like, you know, what if this thing starts to breach the the barrier here, and there's a huge bad thing, and we have, and Saru has to jump, and in the jump, something happens in the calculation of this thing that causes discovery to become the thing, and maybe it's removed from time and moving backwards from a yeah, future endpoint. You've got a predestination paradox. I get it. You've been reading too much coda. Yeah, or you've been going all all good too things. Much. Dude, I have I have a bookshelf that is dedicated to the time travel genre cuz it's its own thing for me. No, you want to get into nonlinear discussions? Oh no, hit me I love time time. travel. We should do that as a special episode too. <laughs> right, uh, exactly. but yeah, so but we should time where... travel forward now. <laughs> yeah. So here's where Ruan tries to pressure Saru into giving him the power that he wants and he makes like Saru yell. Like yeah. yeah. Like Ruan Tarka really is the kind of person who needed to be hit. Like, <laughs> like, bro, you are so out of line, kind of thing. I don't know. Five Whatever. minutes ago, we need to treat our we need to treat our prisoners with more care. Now we just need to punch this dude. This dude. This dude is not a prisoner. This right. dude is just a twat. This, this... Um, <laughs> the behavior is definitely inappropriate for the moment, with all things considered. Listen, are you telling me you wouldn't have enjoyed seeing Jet Reno just walk over and slug the guy? Uh, I wouldn't have enjoyed that. I would have enjoyed seeing Saru do it. Like, come on, Fair. Saru, break that, break that, that rigidity. Yeah. yeah, that would have worked for me too. Especially but I since want, I want Jet Reno because Jet Reno got called Grumpy Lady, and <laughs> she is so much more than that. Yeah. So he was pretty certain that Saru wouldn't have done the the flappy open like so he doesn't have his oh him. yeah the the side Remember yeah. sp the spines no, i was totally waiting for saru to go predator on him and just like pick him up and be like no and then walk <laughs> out of the room with him <laughs> would have been great all right so cut to our next scene we are back on the prison and here's where burnham finds her loophole uh which i don't know why she had to look this one up because she should know this but she can offer asylum right right which makes sense we've seen starfleet captains do it probably in every show it's a real common one i don't know if we've or done it in the tos and maybe it wasn't a 23rd century thing right maybe i don't know i feel like the discussions on offering asylum still come up in every show i'd have to look it up but they should but by the 24th century we have enough ships and outreach to enable captains to have that power where in the 23rd century that power was probably best consolidated because we didn't need to exercise it as much yeah all right, so here we get the revelation that the one dude, Felix, uh, the one who we thought had just gone in a sandcopter joyriding, actually killed someone. He killed an Akali and kept their, like, legacy orb that, mm -hmm. like, has their whole genealogy. Mm -hmm. um, he reveals this to Burnham, and she is like, hey, that's bad. I'm not your judge here, but you shouldn't, you don't deserve to die right now, so let's get going, right? And uh, he seems like he's down... They start making progress and they start heading out of the thing. And uh, when they get to the door, the door shuts again. Because and the it, force field goes up. Because it read one of the prisoners' biometrics. It was like, you're not allowed to leave. Which I think that they knew damn well that that was going to happen. So why would she get that close to the thing? They even said that. that <laughs> well, she was... needs to go out the door. Now, she needs to. This, this highlights a thing that happens in Discovery a couple of times, and it's usually with Burnham centered in it, but there's right. like problems to exponential powers here. The first problem was we need to take care of the, we need to do the, the, the extraction, the beam out, get everybody out. Okay, second problem, there's bug mines. Third problem, the prisoners don't even wanna go. Fourth problem, now we're stuck in the, the thing. Uh, fifth problem it's just problems on problems on problems on problems it's it's yes. like a it's like a good dm in a D, &D game like oh you want to do that but this is in your way uh... I'm, a fan. I'm kind of a fan because they each have different approaches right like the way that she solves one problem is not the same way she solves the others except where one builds on the other so in this case she uses the right. the insectoid landmines to bring down the wall in the force field 
That's smart. That makes sense. If you hack them and took control of them, you can use them as a tool. And good and problem solving. And, and yeah. problem solving is just Star Trek. Right. That that is. Yeah. More Star Trek so, than we've had in. What I wanted season. to say is this reminded me of a lot was of Mark Watney in The Martian, where he's like, "Okay, I fixed this problem. What's next? Okay, yes. I scienced the shit out of this. What's next? Right? Yep. Problem, the problem, the problem until they get out." So I liked it. It's a good comparison. Yeah. Cool. So we go back to the science lab, and uh, they are beginning to increase power on it, and the containment field starts to flutter. Uh, so they start arguing, and Saru pulls out his hollow turn off lever to turn the whole thing off, and uh, they start tweaking it. And uh, Ruan Tarka gives Stamets complete control over it, and he just starts whispering in his ear, "Give it more juice." go a little further keep going oh is that all you can do better like very evil devil on your shoulder kind of thing like yeah. very very much reminiscent of that <laughs> and, uh, like, was like, it. Like, like more more okay yeah and stamets is just like okay i've got power i'm in control again i'm important i can do yeah. this uh -huh. i can be the one that cracks this and uh tarkon is made... just like pushing him well he made saru feel very feeling too like come on yell yell and Finally, Saru does, and he's like, huh, you know what? Yeah, Tark yes, is definitely a manipulator of others. He manipulates people for sure. Oh, yeah. Sure. He got, yeah, that's very clear. Well, um, he's a, he's a mid-30 to 40-something-year-old man who's lived in a burn world his whole life to get what he needed to do to do what he needed to do to be where he is. Yep. He probably had to manipulate a lot of people. And by bringing them close and being like, look, I'm going to give you the illusion that you have all the power and control here. It's going to be great, but I'm actually just going to get what I want, take that away, and leave. I, I can. Um, oh, so sorry, Dan. No, I just that's that's how I explain his his motives and his ability to do these things. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I mean that's that's how manipulation works. You trick other people into doing things that benefit you and think that they have some kind of power over it. So well, have you guys ever done something like that with Zora? with work? For sure, getting somebody to think that something was their idea so that we do the thing I wanted them to do in the first place. That's an everyday thing. No, no, I meant doing something crazy to solve an issue and it works but your colleagues think what possessed you to do that yeah it worked but you're you're crazy yeah Anything? no this this is an all the time thing for me like here's a good example of it right this is <laughs> yeah. from two weekends ago this was mm -hmm. a saturday case that i had to work with a big customer that was having a huge problem okay they had a site a a data center worth of of software that was running very slow and they couldn't figure it out why it was causing all of their deployments to crash and burn essentially yes. right uh we'd gone through the logs and nothing looked particularly wrong everything just looked fine the statistics from the servers themselves even looked good um there was nothing indicating a problem just everything was stupid slow for no good reason uh, and i asked them okay so what's been going on on these sites like is there some maintenance going on and one guy goes, oh, I did find a write-up about how like they're doing power maintenance, but that's not gonna affect this. If they're doing power maintenance, the server will turn off. It won't go slow. And I was like, actually, uh, there are various blade servers, and I know Dell ones in particular do this, but if you take one of their two power plugs and unplug it, the box doesn't turn off. It downclocks its CPU and memory and keeps running, and it doesn't tell you anything until it gets full power again when it reveals yes. that I'm back to normal now. And that turned out to be exactly the cause. And I just guessed it because I'd worked on something similar to that like eight mm -hmm. or nine years ago uh, and guessed it and won. It took them another six hours to confirm that that was the cause, six more hours after that to fix it. But uh, it was like complete lucky guess that I got it. And I got a great kudos email from that customer because of it. Hmm. Whenever you have an issue with something, even if you know for sure it's not a layer one issue, it's a layer one issue. It's going Nothing to be... Is. It's going to be the cable. It's going to be the cabling, but no, yeah, I, I had the same experience. Like, okay, the the server's not coming up. Let's just go ahead and hold in the power button till till it turns off. Big J, isn't that like dangerous? You don't want to do that, right? But that's what we need to do. Do it. Restarting things is step one, right? Like that's yeah. that's where you should start. All right. So the neat thing in this scene is that Zora is tasked to provide like real time updates on the status of the on the field, uh, and they do, uh, which is neat. And we get some cool like countdown moments as the thing is getting really close to 5% when Saru shuts it down. Uh, but uh, uh, Ruan is just pissed, like, come on, we're almost done. The mm -hmm. containment field was at 5%, bro. He gave you to the last second. 
and we get this fantastic line from Jet Reno about, of all the times you've almost destroyed this, uh, this is the closest, and that's really saying something. <laughs> and she's talking to the writers, right? <laughs> Probably a little. That, that was a meta comment. A little yeah. bit of Deadpool. <laughs> <laughs> No, Cut but back it, to the prison. Yep. And everybody's running out the, the field. They're all getting outside. Uh, Burnham calls Discovery, goes, hey, five to beam up. There goes five of the prisoners. And then it's just Book, Burnham, and the last guy. And he's What happened to being able to do 40 people in one cycle? They probably are, but this was this is just Why the have five. Be probably because she knew that he wanted to stay inside and talk. Like like it was pretty clear he wasn't walking outside. He was, now he was they standing have time inside to the talk. shield. I don't get well, this show sometimes. I mean, the, there's. Do you think? What do you think they're gonna do? Beam him through the force field that blocks beaming? Come on, you gotta talk him out. Which is weird because the audience is looking at the force field and it's basically a fence. Yeah, it doesn't go up very high at yeah, all. Yeah, like why is that blocking? I don't know. F it. We've yeah. already given the show so much license. Let's dig it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's not actually the fence that is the sh the the barrier. Maybe it's just the indicator of the the edge of the thing. Okay. Yeah. That that's fine. And that's why everybody can walk through it just fine. Yeah. Because it's not actually like blocking. It's just like this is the perimeter of the prison. Don't go inside here. Right. It's not a wall. It just indicates. But yeah. Are you talking Anyways. about like the the Rura Penthe, uh, beam no, shield? No. I mean like a fence, right? Like a post fence along a property. You can walk in between the posts or step over them they don't actually block you but they tell you what the property line is well, right well but with in my example it was hey feel free to break out go ahead go for a walk but you're gonna die before you can get out of the yeah in the area of the beaming there. shield because of the, uh, the the cold nice and everything else right. so that's maybe kind of how i took it is if you get outside of the the range of the shield there be monsters on the other end. Feel free, good luck. But anyway. okay, yeah. But so in this scene, we get this discussion about how like dude is like, excuse me, where the dude is like, you know what? I committed a crime. I'm a criminal. I deserve to be here. I'm gonna stay. Maybe I die. Maybe I don't. But it's my choice. I'm making this choice. I have agency, and I'm choosing to stay here as my penance. Uh, Book is not really accepting of that logic. He's like, we've got to save everyone. I couldn't save anyone from my world, so I've got to save everyone from yours, essentially is his logic behind it. But Burnham, conversely, is very accepting, which is very un-Burnham, um, generally, as President Rillick observed during the first episode of the season. Burnham is obsessed with saving everyone. Having <laughs> one left behind like this, even if it was by choice, I don't, it seems uncharacteristic of her to let that go, unless she's gone through some actual personal growth, which is certainly possible. Yes. Yeah. I won't expand on that too much because <sighs> we've almost spent two hours talking about a 50 minute episode, which is beyond Trek style. Don't know how we, yeah, we always, to do that. we always make everybody's Monday's commute. Amazing. Hey, True. We're, we're almost done. Yeah. We've, we don't, there's not too much left that's okay. needy in the episode. So if you right. want to comment on this, this is a good one. Uh, I I think that for Burnham, her um, her way out of out of this, which is not quite so much of a character departure, is that, like you said, it was the guy's choice. He wanted to. It's, it's he he knows the risk. He knows what could or couldn't happen. He's done this thing in the past. He wants to serve his penance. It's my choice to be here okay that's a whole different scenario than how she's handled some of those things before like yeah I, t I totally get it is if it were he wanted to leave he wanted to get off the planet but somewhere in the whole thing he broke his leg and like he's just going to slow everyone down that i can see but he made that choice and said no i want to stay which now is not outside of um Burnham's character no I i'll grant you that that's fair I will say one thing though, I was kind of surprised that he's literally the only one that get, that stays. So in every disaster movie, Deep Impact, Armageddon, there's always somebody who's like, I've lived here my whole life. I don't yep. care if I'm gonna die. I'm 88 years old anyways. I'm staying and I'll watch the meteor crash into me in yep. every one of these movies. And I think that that's realistic. Um, there's always somebody who refuses to go. I'm surprised none of the other colonists that there wasn't even one that also refused to be beamed out to. 
Oh, hell no. <laughs> Let's go. I'm I'm leaving. But yeah, oh, you're right. Oh, me too. There's, there's but always I'm that surprised one. that there wasn't. Yeah. All right, cool. So next scene is the two of them leaving, and Book is pissed on the bridge that, like, we didn't save everyone. We did almost everyone, and that's not good enough for him, but he storms off the bridge. Cool. Whatever. And uh, Burnham congratulates everyone on good work. They got over a thousand people off, and uh, they confirm at that moment that the asteroid belt will be within the impact zone of whatever the DMA is doing. And then she hails uh, Felix, the guy that was left behind in the pre prison, Felix. And yeah. He gave his goodbye speech. He, or he gave a very heartfelt a speech that demonstrated he has thought about really hard about what he did. And, uh, <sighs> Oh, a uh, notable thing. Before Burnham beamed out, he also, uh, Felix also gave her the, oh, the thing. Uh, Akali genealogy device orb. that tracks genealogy. So, mm -hmm. and the name is revealed in this scene so that it's somebody to look for for him. And here we get to the, my background on this image here, uh, which is the great scene where we see the energy blast or the waves of gravitons or whatever from the DMA actually affect the asteroid colony and we see what it does. It doesn't shred it, doesn't destroy it the same way we saw with Kuei Jean. It just kind of shoves it. It doesn't even shove it very hard. It doesn't have to, but it shoves it, and it uh, just falls into the sun and breaks up. Well, that was the same thing that happened with Kuei Jean. The moon was pushed into it. Oh, well, there was more than just that. Like, it actually broke up the moon, too. Yeah. Right? But it also destroyed the planet. Like, it was... Well, because it the was force rough. of whatever hit it broke up the moon, so, yeah, naturally, all those... Mm -hmm. Um. So, I don't, I don't think we. Well, and they did just they did say that the little the Akali place was like on the fringe of the location, and so sure. just a tiny little nudge, and it yep. pushed that thing right into the sun. Yeah, oh, and there's a really. Can... Oh, I was Maybe just gonna say the... the effects for seeing the asteroids falling into the sun and heating up, really uh -huh. good effect, really well done. Well, it sure as hell didn't have far to go before it started heating up. Nope. Mm -mm. All right, uh, go ahead. You wanted to bring up something? Uh, okay, well, I want to I want to make sure we've gotten to the part where we discuss their, uh, the findings from that simulation in regards to the power source. I, I, I think that's, like, right the at the findings end. The findings are the bar scene with him and Book. Yeah, that's up in a minute. Okay. The first thing that we do next, though, is the Akali magistrate comes up and bitches at uh, Burnham about how, like, how can we be expected to stay there with these prisoners? Those prisoners can't be kept with us. Put them in your brig. I demand it. Uh, Burnham, the magistrate of what? That, yeah, Did you just tell me what, what to do? Who, whose ship do you think this is? Oh, no, this is my <laughs> ship. So, yeah, she kind of puts him in his place and reminds him that they're subject to Federation law. So... You are too, as long as you're on the ship. And so he calms down, and he heads back to the uh, the engineering deck or wherever he was being held. And there, and she reminds him that they're all arriving as refugees, seeking shelter and grace from people. So, uh, and hope you get treated better than you, you treated, treated these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a really good little moralizing moment for her. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good scene. Uh, we cut back now to Culber and Stamets, a very good romantic little scene where they're both like, I mean, I'm damaged. I'm damaged too. Hey, let's be damaged together. <laughs> Our damages are compatible. Right? They should have kissed. And they could have kissed. They should have kissed. Uh, they should have kissed. They just ended up staring at each other, but that's like a total connective moment right there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was a really good scene. It definitely shows that there's been growth on Stamets' side because of the way that he talks about like how reckless Ruan Tarko was and how it feels a little familiar to how he used to be very single-minded and uh you know culber talks about his time with kovich and how his unmasking of his use of work to cover his own trauma isn't perfect so they uh they are a good couple they support each other it's a very it's a heartwarming scene yeah it is and it's a scene that a lot of the fans have been asking for is how come we're not getting more of these touching scenes between Stamets and Colbert. And so I'm really happy that they delivered here. 
-hmm. So our next scene is actually pretty, I, I'm going to break this one into two parts, but the next scene is actually Burnham in the turbo lift talking to Zora and uh, Zora is like, yeah, I found the girl. She's over here. Let me take you there. Yeah. Also, pass my condolences. Uh, this seems like a rough time for her. Huh? And uh, Burnham's like, uh, pass your condolences? Are you capable of having empathy? And the computer's like, yeah, it's a recent thing. I just got it. New upgrade. New software. Right? <laughs> and uh, it's a very interesting back and forth. New software. No, I, I, I took it to be more like more like diagnostic like con running diagnostics on the existing framework over time and building in all this new data suddenly these yeah. oh this, yeah this no, manifests okay yeah okay. yeah yeah no. sorry i was making a joke about new software it, yeah it's definitely an emergent property <laughs> right AI that's there and and it's not like emergent properties in artificial intelligences are rare in star trek we we had a whole episode called emergence where the enterprise gave birth to a baby pipe bomb or something i don't know what that was but <laughs> well that's the question here right is zora an emergent intelligence or an artificial intelligence right it seems like there's a bit of both right because i was gonna say are those venn diagrams they're not mutually exclusive you can be an artificial intelligence that obtains emergent intelligence because there's emotional intelligence and practical intelligence all kinds of intelligence so let's not limit ourselves to you know, okay so I would argue that the definitions in their strictest sense are exclusive of one or the other, right? An emergent intelligence would be a piece of software that becomes sentient without ever being intended to become sentient, right? Written by people was never meant to be. It just develops into that state, right? It's Whereas an artificial intelligence is something that is created with the parameters to be sentient, right? One is created to be that way. The other one just becomes that way. Well, I you mean... Know where we, we we run, you know, when you want to teach an AI how to play like a Super Mario Brothers, you, you teach it the basic controls, forward, back, jump, and then a victory condition. And then it just has to obtain the victory condition. It doesn't know anything about the world, and you can watch this computer run Mario into that Goomba 8,000 times before it figures out that jumping avoids the Goomba, then it goes into the first pit 8,000 times. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the intelligence that emerges there is functional how do i get through a certain space but let's say we ran that scenario for a thousand years just one little little computer with the direction to do these things with as much hard drive space as it needed to restore every attempt and opportunity that it did after a thousand years is that computer going to start having some kind of empathy reaction i don't think so like, I, I don't see that, right? So I think Tron Legacy, I think, does a really good job of showing us the difference, the movie, uh, of the difference between the two, right? So the programs that were created by the users, those are all AIs, right? Yes. They show some level of hard artificial intelligence and sentience. Cool. The ones that came out of the data desert or whatever, whose name now escapes me, the people who are like Korra or whatever, right. yeah. they are emergent intelligences. They were not yes. designed the ISOs. that way. The ISOs, yes. The isomorphs, yep. that's what it was. Yes. They are emergent intelligences. They're not constrained by the same parameters that were written to design the AIs. So the difference would be, if you created a software whose purpose was to solve Mario, and it somehow did become self-aware and sentient, that would be an AI, right? Whereas right. if you had a piece of software whose purpose was... Bank nothing, transactions. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. or bank transactions, right? Something that's not actually intended to do, like, solve something. <laughs> right. That becomes self-aware and, and sentient. That would be an emergent intelligence. You go to, like, deposit money into your mafia account, and the bank's like, no, you're a bad man. Go away. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just not sure which one Zora is. I think I'm leaning on the side of being an emergent because most of that came from the red ball or whatever it was the red star or whatever the, the, thing the sphere was. Data. red sphere that's what it was you know yeah. i i i still think there's a case to say that she could have gone through the faces of both could have been something that was supposed mm -hmm. to be an ai but then amassed this vast database um and whatever processor it has to examine that database and whatever knowledge it's picking up now with the new technology it has available to it has expanded its ability to be an ai from or be an emergent AI. Like, like think of uh, Voyager 6, V'ger, and whatever the hell it became after it merged with Decker. Mm -hmm. That was definitely an AI, though, because it had this specific command 
learn all that is learnable, sure. and then return home. Well, yeah. and that was a command that was input by whoever reprogrammed it, because V'ger itself was not an intelligent anything. It was just record the stuff. The, yeah. They built an AI that achieved sentience and then wanted to go beyond that into whatever it became when it merged with Decker. It'd be great if this if this guy if this thing here was like, oh, it's V'ger. <laughs> this is a thousand years later. <laughs> Well, you know what I think is going to happen if they don't stop playing around? I'm expecting open the pod bay doors, Hal. It, it, it's, uh, it's going yeah, to... Yeah, I mean, I'm not... I'm not make a, it out of hand. I'm not I an AI do cynic. That, Dave. I'm mm -hmm. not an AI cynic, but I do think that the discussions that uh, our AI scientists are having right now about setting up like actual constraints on what kind of research they can do are very uh, smart. It makes sense to to understand what you're doing more before you turn something on. Because we don't know how current AIs function. Like, they're not hard AIs, they're not sentient. But right now, the best artificial intelligences are programmed by artificial intelligences. So we, we don't know how they function. After you let that Mario program run for 8,000 cycles, and then another 80,000 cycles, we stop understanding the software that's behind it. Like, that's already true. So that's mm -hmm. a bit scary to me. Um, right. But yeah, so the scene on the turbo lift ends pretty abruptly when she's like, oh, good to know that you're now a, now more capable of emotions. Like, doesn't go any further into it, doesn't ask any more questions. Cool. Like, just whatever. She gets off and uh, she walks down a hallway and she finds this girl, this pregnant woman, uh, who is the girl from the story that Felix had told. And uh, interesting thing maybe it's a not starfleet thing but i'm surprised that she's just roaming the halls on her own i would expect that she'd be contained to a cargo bay or to the to a sick like maybe not sick bay but like uh something with like actual constraints so she can't just wander around there's a what's, little what's bit of timey wimey skippy here mm -hmm. you know and and maybe they they opened up non-classified non you know specific areas of the ship so they could wander around Instead of keeping them huddled in a in a cargo bay, right? But it was a beautiful scene, and she opens yeah. it up and she adds her face to the tree, and she feels and she's pregnant, so she's going to be adding another face to the tree soon. Right, right, and it's it's a very it's a very touching and and cool scene for closure for someone who never thought they were going to get it. All right, um, and that takes and us to the bar, which is where Big J wanted to talk a bit. Yes. Okay. So, after doing the uh, research of a simulation with an actual live model of the anomaly, but one that was that was smaller, they come to a conclusion that they believe this is not naturally occurring, but something that possibly was created, and that there is a person or entity behind that because of its behavior what's needed to power it and so that takes me back to what we were talking about in the in the beginning with how, how it's how it's targeting things at first i thought well it's this has to be bigger than just going after previous worlds or colonies that were part of uh, the emerald chain it, it, even though it seems coincidental that those are the things that have been destroyed you're right. It has somehow found a way to, if it wanted to, it could just destroy Earth, Navarre, uh, Starfleet headquarters, whatever it wanted. But it's basically just kind of hanging around the same general area, just chilling. Um, so, I I'm really interested to see what the what the purpose is for this thing. But I am, am really going more uh, agreeing with the part that. This is this is something that was that was created and is is being being used, but why is is the tough part? And I'll tell you right now, I swear to God, if the thing behind this anomaly was a Kelpian child that had a fit somewhere over something, I'm done. I'll never watch Star Trek again. I can't do that in another season. That's already happened before. Let this this needs to be something that was not an accidental creation we're not looking i'm not looking for that the burn that was that was already that the way they explained how it happened was a great explanation i don't know how i wanted it to go but 
not like that. You know, so, yeah. I have had this sci-fi concept burning around in my brain, thinking about like higher levels of, of existence and stuff like that, yeah. and and how we have atom smashers today. But what if you know? What if our whole universe exists in the blink of an eye, in which an atom is smashed in a machine in another bigger realm by other people? And what if those people had tools to to like micro analyze those explosions for signs of intelligence that would be us and how would they how would those how would those scans manifest to us this giant 3 AU wide anomaly that just moves from place to place and has no idea that it is destructive because they're they're looking for signs of intelligence totally unaware that they're actually messing with it because that intelligence has no way to announce itself but this 3AU wide thing could just be like a f of a, the tip of a needle from a flux scanner or something like that. You know, how we look for radio waves and, and signs of, um, you know, spectral signs of, of ha cohabitation on other worlds. These little tools that they're poking into our frame of reference for a split second, um, they're looking for signs of, ex of existence here and it's not us. And I just think that would be really, really cool if we found a way, if that is the, the, the trick here, that they found a way to send a message through that area to be like, hey, stop poking us. I know we only exist for a blink of an eye, but geez, order a pizza. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a fair one, Dag, right? Like something about the observers of the outside like universe or something along those lines. That could certainly be. I mean, the fact that it does gravitational lensing and they keep calling out gravitational lensing is certainly possible because we on Earth use gravitational lensing for observing things that are far away. Mm -hmm. That's part of how the James Webb Telescope is going to like look at things too. It's designed specifically to rely on it. Well, and the mass so, of that needle compared to our galaxy is going to be incredible and, and definitely would have things lensing around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a certainly good theory. I'm hoping that it's actually something like this is someone with a bone to pick right like someone trying to get revenge a mad scientist still out there to try and who is a, a mad scientist who is benefiting because of the burn right like i'm an old ass vulcan i'm 200 years yep. old i remember before the burn and now i remember this that we were better off since the burn here i've figured out a way to break planets kind of thing i've <laughs> to break planets I, I i think i can get behind that i i can get behind someone or something that's created something maybe got out of control or is a higher level sentient being that created this i i well what i would like to see happen based off this information you learned from this episode is that give me a motive behind this thing that someone had some kind of motive or action or purpose for it not just have it be some random naturally created anomaly yeah i think i'd be i'd be good if there was someone or something that was behind it and had a purpose for it to whether it was intentional or accidental destroy uh, quajon and i know whatever it did that ended up pushing the colony that seems more of a accidental thing than it was for, for Quajon. And I don't know, maybe maybe that was also an accidental thing. It, it's kind of like if maybe this thing's some kind of baby, and you know, it's it, but it's very large and it doesn't I'm know where it's, it's at, nothing what like it's that. doing. I'm and hoping it's nothing like a natural phenomenon or something birthing <laughs> or the great bird of the galaxy. Nothing like that, I hope. Have you ever I'm, seen Cloverfield? Yes. Yeah. I'm. That's, that's what I'm thinking is something like Cloverfield. That please thing keep was, Jar Jar abrams away from this sort of thing <laughs> i'm i'm gonna be incredibly sorry for postulating this though but since this whole arc since the whole story seems to be about uh books recovery from having to deal with all this what if he has to use his magic druid powers on whatever this is to communicate with it it's a bit of a stretch but what are you telling me that you didn't get enough out of zero trying to talk to the murder planet nope it just wants to eat us <laughs> <laughs> from prodigy come on that was really good I know. yeah you're right but yeah but again this this show isn't for kids this show isn't the the, the meta metaphor that lower decks is this show's about connection 
endurance right. and healing. And I think it's totally plausible that whatever is inside or on the other side of this anomaly, Book's druid powers are going to come to play here. I think, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to do a Big J prediction. It is uh, today, December 16th, 2021, 11.50 p.m. Eastern Central Time, Eastern Standard Time. My prediction is this thing is going to end up being essentially a newborn, some kind of newborn, some kind of baby, some some kind of a, a giant in a cardboard house sort of thing. The stuff that's happening, the way it's reacting and moving is because it's scared, it's frightened. It, it's this environment that it's in is is like, well, just go watch Cloverfield. I mean, for anyone who can <laughs> just, that's, that's what it is. I, I can't think of any better way to describe it than all right, everybody. Yeah, because that, that thing was, every, a lot of people have said that the way that that was acting, reacting, whatnot, is it's because it was a it was a baby, it was a child, even though it was big as shit. Well, so what the, what Jay is proposing is mm -hmm. a fusion of Star Trek versus Kaiju. So prepare for Pacific Rim three Galactic Rim. <laughs> I'm more interested in that than I am in the idea of this being like uh, an observer effect thing. I'd rather the kaiju battle than that. I don't know. I, I'm so that's one, Renzo's prediction. I'm you gotta no, give no, no. The, get, get, <laughs> the time. No, no, no. My prediction is honestly some sort of mad scientist trying to get even or trying to preserve like the chaos of the burn. That's my guess. Hmm. I hope it's that. You know what we need? We need a a predictions pot. Like just yeah, everyone really puts should. five really bucks should. into a into what we call the predictions pot, and if any of us, if we're like all wrong, we just keep building it for other audience, other shows and predictions. Tell us what you guys think is actually right. the cause of this thing, right? Like this yeah. is a good time. We've now heard enough that we can come up with some pretty good theories as to what's doing it. I'm actually not even ruling out that Ruan Tarka is somehow behind it too. I'm not ruling that out at this point. I think it's a mad scientist sort of thing, but tell us what you guys think and write it to us in the comments or respond to us on Twitter. Let us know it's, if you've got a good one. It's the Changeling's it. revenge for losing the Dominion War. Uh, <laughs> it's a clone of Khan who woke up on the Botany Bay a thousand years later. Um, it was it, played by Benedict Cumberbatch. It's the physical manifestation of the flying spaghetti monster <laughs> here to pasta your faris. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I'm still leaning into book is going to be a part of this, and through it he's going to find healing. Like I don't know if yeah. this thing absorbed the life forces of, you know, his family and everybody on Quajon or not. I don't, I don't think that would be a great ending for him because it would be just like, um, what's his name, uh, Colber, living is to spit in the face for everybody else who lost somebody. Bringing back everybody on Quajon to give it back to Book would be a spit in the face to the, tri the trial and the struggle that ooh, he's endured. Ooh, ooh. What if it ends up going like how Data has all the memories of the people from the planet he was birthed on? Uh, as, That'd like, be fine. Were... Right, I'd imagine be okay if with that, that happens to Book, though. But imagine but, if that happens to Book. And Book has to connect with it, and then he becomes the fosterer of those All memories. the memories of his people, yeah. right? Totally okay that with seems, that. Oh, that seems so cruel to me. Hey, um, so here's what we got. We'll do like a, yeah. like from Twilight. We've got a Team Jacob, Team Edward. We'll do a Team Renzo. He's on the mad scientist end of this thing. Team Big J. It's a child or a baby. Kaiju. Kind of thing. Yeah, kaiju, yeah. Team Dag is, what's your, it, there's going to be some kind of, well, uh, but the, the whole I'm, Druid thing, it doesn't really explain go, where, it, where it came from. No, and sometimes we don't need closure in that way. It's a big bad thing. We have to deal with it now. J See, and Renzo, closure. I Renzo, closure. Renzo's gonna lose his shit if we don't figure out who's behind all of this. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> that will be some Jar Jar Abrams bullshit mystery box that I Jar Jar hate. Abrams. Wow. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going with the uh, telepathic hug probe. Let's just call it that. It's not a wormhole death cannon. 
Well, audience, if you've stuck with us this long, thank you so much for enduring another round with uh, Beyond Trek Podcast. Uh, check us out on Twitter at Beyond Trek Pod. We're on YouTube at Beyond Trek Productions. You can find us anywhere you get your audio, Anchor, Spotify. We're everywhere. Um, hit us up on Twitter. Let us know what you think. And uh, as always, thank you for going boldly with Beyond Trek Podcast. Hey everybody, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our Patreon and Anchor supporters. Big thanks to Stephanie Baker, S. Tam, Anne Marie, Jim Cook, and Nora Hickson. We really appreciate your support. Thanks for being a part of Beyond Trek Podcast. We are Beyond Trek Podcast. Lower your inhibitions and surrender your years. We will add inspirational and hilarious Trek content to your day. Your attention will adapt to subscribe to us. Resistance is futile.